Good morning, everybody. Uh, today is Monday, February 8th, 2021. Hopefully you had a uh, good and productive weekend. Uh, today we are finishing off the last little bit of material we need for this first section, and that is to finish our information about blood, focusing on the formed elements. And then uh, again, we will uh, piggyback on some of the uh, um, lab activities you've had by talking a little bit about blood typing, make sure we understand that because that's going to help us really lead into the kind of things we're going to be talking about in the next section when we talk about our immune response. That should not take our entire class time. Again, we tried to front load this stuff a little bit so there wouldn't be too much new stuff today. Uh, so there should be time at the end of class for review. Remember, uh, for review for the exam, I don't stand up here and tell you what I think is important. This is your opportunity to ask me questions about what you're unclear about. And we'll see if we can come up with some good answers for that. Um, all leading up to uh, Wednesday's exam, I will tell you that Thursday, I had my first exam of the semester with our 430 class, and it was an experience. So uh, again, we are have the lab and lecture exam. Both of them are timed exams. Uh, they must be completed during the class time. Uh, again, um, you may have two hours, two and a half hours for the lecture portion of this, but if you start it at noon, you're only gonna have the 35 minutes that remain in the class. Also, you can take them in any order that you want. I'm getting to that in a second in any order that you want. However, after Thursday, I strongly recommend you take the lab first. We have been online for a semester, uh, for a year, pardon me. And even in that very first semester, when we had to go on midway, I did not have the types of problems that I had in my lab exams in the 430 class. Uh, literally one third of the students had problems with the lab exam loading. The lab exam has a lot of images. I've had problems in the past with people who had difficulties with that. Uh, and, but a third of the class could not get the images to load properly. Now, having some, had some time to go over it, the two things that I will point out is that what I saw the most is that uh, a lot of the people that had issues, not everybody, but a lot of the people who had issues either had poor internet connections at the time, and that can obviously affect one of it, so the Wi-Fi could be one of the issues. The other issue that I saw fairly consistently across people was that one of the things that Proctorio recommends is that you have two gigabytes of free RAM available to you. And a lot of the people who were having problems had less than a gig of RAM readily available. So one of the things you might wanna do is make sure all your other programs are closed and all those types of things are going on. Make sure you have uh, the systems that are capable of working for that. Ultimately, what I had to do for their exams with so many people having issues is I set their lab exam to rather than providing all of the images at once to just present one image at a time. So you went one question at a time through it. Now, if you remember up in the top right of the screen, there is the list of the questions. So you don't have, so if you're on question 42 and you wanna go back to 12, you don't have to hit back, 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 back 30 times. You have to, um, you can just click on question 13. If you leave a question blank, it'll have a zero there where you answer it as a check mark. So there are some ways to quickly go through that Unfortunately, Chrome is what we have to use for these, but yes, but um, so again, a lot of people had problems. I don't like that format for the lab exams when we're online, but if I have to do that, I will, if that's gonna be the case. I'm not going to change our format. I'm hoping that was more of an aberration and I'm hoping with a warning, you guys won't have that issue. But here are the things that I will tell you right now. If you have loading issues with the images, the very first thing you should do is contact And here. Let's write this all down just to make sure that we have this on record. If you have problems, and again, only problems with the lab exam because there were so many images, there's even more on that. Oops, why is that not writing? The first thing that you want to do is contact uh, Proctorio's tech support. 
in that little box where you see your video image, where the white box is, where the uh, other tools are located, the, uh, the increase and decrease is a way to contact the uh, Parktorio's tech support. Um, yeah, uh, if, yeah, if you've got a lot of people in your household all zooming at the same time, that could be an issue. Uh, but again, again it only, we can only take this during the class time. So that isn't something that I can change for people. If it continues to be an issue, then the next thing you need to do is contact me after that. Uh, the problem and the concern you have is that while you're having these problems, once you start the exam, the timer begins. So if you've got 90 minutes to take the lab exam and you spend the first 40 trying to get in, that's only leaving you 50 minutes for the lab exam. So if it gets to the point where it's taking 20, 30 minutes, contact me and what we can do is I can end your current exam and I can give you a new exam. And if we have enough people that have this problem, uh, then what I will do is I will change the format of the lab exam. Uh, so then if, what happens, contact me. Uh, and if you're not able to get in, then I can encourage you to make it two way switch to the lecture exam. So you're not just sitting there doing nothing. Then uh, if I continue to have problems, people see that people are having problems, I will change the format and then you will be able to take the exam. Typically, if I'm gonna change the format and we're going question by question, I will add a little time uh, for that processing time to that, for that to occur that way, all right? Again, having problems is something that unfortunately does happen in this format. But you cannot be like a student I had in my 430 class who had these types of problems and then waited till the very next day to contact me to ask if they were able to take the exam again. Even though I had sent four or five emails to the students, I'd post announcement on Canvas trying to make everybody aware that this was a consistent problem that many people were having and they needed to communicate with me. That student, for whatever reason, chose not to communicate with me on that day and instead waited a full 24 hours before contacting me. And obviously, you do not get to take the exam a second time a full day after everybody else gets to take it. So again, I should not be the first person that you contact. Contact Pretoria support. They are helpful at being able to resolve many of the issues that people have. Uh, again, uh, I will say it again, because I want to emphasize it. The two main issues that I saw with people, one was again, not having enough RAM. One was having not having, having a poor internet connection. I will also say that I had two people who either purposely or unintentionally uh, we're, we're running virtual machines. Uh, if that means nothing to you, then you can feel free to ignore what I'm saying, uh, but uh, do not try to use a virtual machine shell to run this because that can cause problems as well. All right, I am hoping this is an aberration. I have given literally 50 exams online uh, so far in the past year, uh, probably more. Uh, and uh, this is the first time that I've had issues at this level. So I'm hoping that it was an aberration, maybe problems with the connection between Canvas and Proctorio or something along those lines. I'm not going to start by changing the format of our lab exam because I prefer this format better, but that is why if you do have these problems, contact me and I can change the format uh, if it is an issue. All right, questions on any of that? All right, after you take the lab and lecture exam, take a good five, 10, even 15 minute break. And then after that, I want you diving right into the new material. Right, Monday is a holiday, so you do have a full week off, but I will tell you right now mathematically, and by mathematically, I mean that the second section of the class typically has the lowest average scores on the lab and lecture exam. So mathematically, the second section tends to be the hardest. I think one of the re I think there are two main reasons for that. I think the first main reason is with the immune response, with the endocrine system, we are doing a lot of chemical and cellular interactions. These aren't things you can hold in the, your hand the same way you can hold a heart in your hand and poke it and prod it and make some sense out of it. And there is a ton of histology 
getting used to looking at tissues is one of those things that there is no shortcut for. It takes a lot of time and a lot of practice to get used to it. And it's not particularly fun for many students. And so they don't put the time and effort into it, but easily half this exam could be histology, if not more. The other reason I find people tend to do more poorly on this second section is because the other thing that's happening during the second section is you guys are gonna be forming groups. I will be forming you into groups. You will be selecting presentation topics and you will be preparing to give an eight to 12 minute oral presentation uh, over Zoom to the classroom. This is a 50 point assignment. It's a big important part of the class and it's something that I want people to put time and effort into. But remind me again, how much, how many points the lecture exams are worth? 100. 100 points, absolutely. And this particular lab exam is usually somewhere around 60 to 70 questions. So that means it's 60 to 70 points. So while your group presentation is important, it's not more important than the lab exam, and it's definitely not more important than the lecture exam. And I find that too many people get too in depth on their presentations and don't spend enough time focusing on the other material they're supposed to be learning as well. So those are the two big traps. Those are the two big concerns about this next section. So with a whole week off, this is not spring break where woo -hoo, you get to go crazy. This is an opportunity for you to start looking at the material and thinking ahead about the material so that you can be successful with this material. And towards that end, I am providing you with two assignments, the unit 21 pre-lab and the unit 16 pre-lab. Remember the pre-labs are not the reviews. If you look at your section in the lab manual, each section of the lab manual has three parts. It has the review that we've been turning on, uh, turning in for assignments. There's the middle part where there's all the activities that normally we'd be doing and we're not because we're not in the classroom. But at the beginning of each unit is a pre-lab. Those pre-labs typically are vocabulary, some labeling activities, things along those lines as well. All right, so those two pre-labs are due at the beginning of the class on Wednesday when we're here. Again, we are several weeks into 431. You all successfully, successfully completed 430. So you know it is important to be here every day, but it is especially important to be here on the 17th because that is when I will be forming groups only with the students that are here and present. Those groups will then pick their topics. So if you're not here, you're not in a group. If you're not here, you're not getting a topic. If you're not here, you're getting a zero on this assignment. All right, questions on any of that? Again, I see that there are a couple messages here in the chat. I appreciate that people have issues with their, you know, Wi-Fi because other people are using it and zooming in at the same time, or they may have older computers and all those types of things. And I appreciate that. Unfortunately, with this format of us being online, having a machine that is capable of doing all of the things that is necessary, that is technologically advanced enough to be able to handle all of the technology we're using and having a uh, consistent and reliable uh, Wi-Fi or broadband is something that is a requirement for this class. I appreciate that this is not the intuitive way that we normally do this stuff, but this is not the intuitive way we normally do this stuff. So unfortunately, if you are choosing to take this class in this environment. Those are part of the requirements of the things that are necessary, right? Again, same way you would need a Scantron if we were in the classroom. There are certain things you must have uh, to take this class. And when we're doing it in this online environment, you must have reliable access to online and a, and a machine, a computer that is capable of doing all the things that we need it to do. So again, I apologize for that, but unfortunately that is the nature of this class. If those are things that you can't or aren't comfortable with, then again, you're not required to take this class right now and there is still time to drop. So uh, I apologize for that. I don't like it any more than you like it, but unfortunately that is the necess that's what's necessary for us in this situation. All right. Yes, it was a very fun day. All right. Questions on any of that? I'm hoping it's an aberration. I'm hoping that's not a, because uh, again, like I said, in all the time we've been online, even when we first went online, it has never been as bad as it was on Thursday. So that was brutal. So hopefully the same thing 
Knock on wood will not happen for us. All right, enough of the doom and gloom. Questions on any of that? All right, excellent. Then let us switch gears and get back into our lab. I mean, our lecture, pardon me. Do, do, do. There it is. All right. We left off last class and we had just finished talking about our blood plasma. We had spun our uh, blood around in the centrifuge and separated things out. And we had talked about the fact that we have three main types of formed elements. And again, remember formed elements is that fancy word we use for cells, because as we talked about in the last one, erythrocytes are not true cells in the sense of the term as a mature red blood cell. They were at one point true mature cells, but then they, uh, when they mature into erythrocytes, they are basically just big bags of hemoglobin. And as we also talked about, our thrombocytes are basically just cell pieces that came off of a true cell, but are not true cells themselves. So we use that fancy word formed element or term formed elements. Let's talk about our erythrocytes first. They are by far the most numerous of all of our formed elements. In a single drop of blood, there is somewhere on the average of 5 million red blood cells. Now I'll be honest, I'm not the one who counted them, but that's what they tell me. So I will take that uh, as their word. Erythrocytes have a very distinct shape, making them very easy to identify. Uh, one of the things, as we've already pointed out, is that it does not have a nucleus in its mature, shape, uh, mature state. But notice one of the other things we look at when we look at this illustration, we, say, see, oh God, we see that it has a biconcave shape. What does that mean? has a concave shape on both sides of it. Exactly. So if you notice, it kind of looks like a donut where the hole has not been pushed all the way through. There are a couple key advantages to that. What are the key advantages to this biconcave shape? Helps bind oxygen better, I think. Well, a great, it, it does absolutely have to do with oxygen. One, it's not so much how it binds it, because how it binds it goes is what's going on on the inside. But what it does help is with the diffusion of the oxygen. Uh, this gives it a massive uh, surface to volume ratio. And with a larger surface to volume ratio, it makes it much easier for it both to take on and to release oxygen. Because that is one of the big keys with this. It reversibly binds oxygen. And so having that biconcave shape uh, helps to give a huge surface area for that movement of oxygen into and out of the red blood cell. But I do see an S at the end there. So there must be at least one other advantage. Anyone know what that might be? How it moves it's shape through the veins. Yeah, absolutely. And again, not so much the veins, but remember the capillaries are so, so tiny that the capillaries uh, are, are so small that the red blood cells have to line up in single file to get through them. So this biconcave shape, it appears, gives it some flexibility and give in its maneuverability as it's going through those tiny spaces of the capillaries. Excellent, 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 excellent. And then, of course, as we talked about, what is the primary function of the erythrocytes? We already said it, but let's say it again. Transport oxygen. Absolutely. It's going to transport oxygen. And it does that by reversibly binding oxygen. We'll talk about it in a second, but I know you guys know it. How is it that oxygen binds to the in the red blood cell? What actually binds the oxygen? Okay, maybe you don't know. Thought you knew. The heme? No, you know. Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, absolutely. And what particular component of the hemoglobin is it that does the binding? 
Hemi, the heme group. Fire. Yeah, the heme group. And what's smack dab at the center of the heme group? Iron. Iron, absolutely. All right, let's take a look. Here is a hemoglobin. Again, as I'm sure you remember from 430, here is its quaternary structure where we have four subunits of polypeptides put together into a single functional protein. Notice there are two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. But notice also at the center of each of these four subunits, we have this structure known as a heme. And while I'm not gonna make you memorize or draw the structural composition of a heme, what we do see smack dab at the center of it is an iron. As we know, or anybody who's ever seen a Studebaker sitting on the front lawn of somebody's house, iron attracts oxygen. And when that iron binds to the oxygen on that you know, uh, fender of that Studebaker sitting on the front yard, what happens? It rusts. It rusts. And what color is Oxidizes. new? Oxidizes. Yeah. What color, well, new rust sounds silly. What color is rust when it first forms? Brown. Well, it's a reddish. It does brown with age, but it's more of a reddish orangish color when it first forms. And in fact, that's how our red blood cells get their color. When the oxygen binds to the iron, it gives it a reddish coloration. And the more that binds, the more reddish that blood gets, which is something we already knew. We know that oxygen rich blood has a bright red color and oxygen poor blood has a dark deep, uh, you know, more um, of a dark dull red color because of how much oxygen is bind to that iron. However, of course, when that rust forms on the Studebaker, how do you get rid of the rust? Can you get rid of rust really? Scrape it off. Yeah, you pretty much have to cut it off. Once that oxygen binds to the iron, it stays there pretty much forever. Right. Obviously, that's not what happens in our erythrocyte. The big key with this erythrocyte is that it is able to reversibly bind oxygen. Oxygen binds strongly to it, and then it will also let go. However, and this is probably a good place to have this conversation, oxygen is not the only thing that this hemoglobin binds. It also binds carbon dioxide. However, not on the same binding site. This is important. It's not like musical chairs where oxygen and iron are both competing for the same seat. Right? Now, oxygen and carbon dioxide have different binding sites, different locations where they will connect. They do influence each other. So they have different binding sites, but they do influence each other. I always think of this in terms of my daughters. I have two daughters and I have a very big couch. There's plenty of room for both of them to sit out at the same time. And occasionally they will. However, when one sits on the couch, is it more likely or less likely that the other one will sit on the couch? Less likely. Less likely, absolutely. Depends on the relationship. <laughs> yeah, true, exactly. Well, it depends on the time of day, really, is what it depends on. There'll be some times where they'll be all over each other, and other times where they want nothing to do with each other. So again, it's not the perfect analogy, but you get the idea. Um, one, when oxygen binds, it makes it harder for the carbon dioxide to bind, but not impossible. When carbon dioxide binds, it makes it harder for the oxygen to bind, but not impossible. So they influence each other, but they're not competing for the same seat. This is very different for something like carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide does compete with oxygen for the same binding site. And carbon dioxide has a higher affinity I always like using these fancy terms because again, these are the kind of things that you can call grandma up and say, hey, guess what grandma, carbon monoxide has a higher affinity than oxygen. And she'll be very impressed and she'll send you 20 bucks in the mail. But what does that actually mean? It's electrically more compatible with the binding site than oxygen is. 
Exactly. And so that means two things. It is if both are competing at the same time, not only is carbon monoxide more likely to win, but once it binds, it doesn't like to let go. That's the problem with carbon monoxide poisoning. If you load up all of these hemoglobin with carbon monoxide, the oxygen can't bind to it. And remember, as we talked about, something like 98% of the oxygen that is being transported in our blood is transported bound to these hemoglobins. So when carbon monoxide binds to that hemoglobin, you can no longer carry oxygen and can't get the oxygen you need to the tissues of your body. And tissues that are sensitive to oxygen deprivation, like the heart, like the brain, can be seriously damaged by even uh, short-term exposures to carbon monoxide. All right, excellent. So again, here we go. Bind strongly but reversibly and also carbon monoxide. A single red blood cell, again, I'm not the one who did the counting on this, but has somewhere around 280 million hemoglobin. Let's keep the math simple. Let's round down to 250 million. So each red blood cell has 250 million hemoglobin on it. Each hemoglobin can bind how many oxygens? 250 mil, uh, two, one. Wait, each four. hemoglobin can bind four. Each heme can only bind one, but each hemoglobin has four. So four oxygen per hemoglobin, 250 million hemoglobin per red blood cell, five million red blood cells in a single drop of blood. How much oxygen can a single drop of blood carry? Exactly, Allison's got it correct, a lot. Absolutely, a lot, and again, those are astronomical numbers when you think about it, but it gives you a sense of how important our oxygen, that oxygen is to the metabolism of our cells. All right, questions on hemoglobin. All right, excellent. Now, as we talked about, when we spun our blood, we were able to separate the formed elements from the um, plasma. And as we talked about, the vast majority, 99.9% .9 of all of the formed elements are red blood cells. So when we took that measurement of how much plasma we had, right, we said about 55, and how much formed elements we had, we had 45, essentially that percentage of formed elements is really the percentage of red blood cells. There's a tiny, tiny amount of white blood cells and a tiny, tiny amount of platelets but for the most part, it is a measure of our total amount of erythrocytes, which obviously influences how much oxygen we can carry. And so that amount of formed elements in our blood when we spin it down is what we call our hematocrit. And remember we used average numbers of 45% formed elements and 55% plasma. But obviously there are some minor differences between males and females. These are of course are significant from a mathematical standpoint, right? Uh, females, the average is about 42 and males about 46. And why that difference? Exactly, Allison is correct because males are better, right? No, again, it's just one of those things that uh, again, um, you said it, not me. I was just repeating what I saw you mouth. You said, I totally saw it. Um, Excellent. No, again, these are one of those things like heights. When you have the vast number of individuals that we have, right, small differences can be mathematically significant, but whether they are functionally significant is not accurate. Right? So again, these are not necessarily meaningful differences and certainly not numbers that are important to us. However, what is important is that oxygen carrying capacity. If you don't have enough red blood cells, if your red blood cells do not have enough hemoglobin, if the hemoglobin you're producing is not fully functional. If any of these things happen, then what can happen as a result of that is that you are not able to deliver enough oxygen to the tissues of your body, and we typically call that condition anemia. I think we talked about this in the last class, but we can mention it again here. The obviously the opposite is true as well. As we talked about, if you're one of those endurance athletes who take you know, a pint of blood out a month before a competition, 
And then right before you go riding your little bicycle around on that racetrack, you decide to take that pint of blood and pump it back into your body. You are going to dramatically and rapidly increase your hematocrit by adding a whole lot of new red blood cells back into your body. Obviously that dramatically increases your oxygen carrying capacity of your blood, allowing you to provide much more oxygen for your muscle cells. So they're able to produce ATP aerobically for a longer period of time, staving off the production of lactic acid, staving off fatigue and allowing you to go faster, longer, stronger and win that race, which is all awesome. Cause again, all we care about is winning, getting that gold medal, but as we also talked about, what's the problem with that? Taking that pint of blood and pumping it into your body? Increases your blood pressure. Dramatically increases your blood pressure. Remember one of the things we talked about is not only is blood pressure bad for the kidneys, which is as we're gonna see for affects filtration there, affects uh, the capillary exchange that we talked about. But remember we also talked about how that afterload on the heart influences how much blood it's able to pump out. So if you dramatically increase your blood volume and your blood pressure, your heart has to work stronger and longer and faster to be able to move the same amount of blood. It also changes the viscosity of the blood. So it can be very, very damaging to the heart. But like we said, as long as you win the race, that's all that matters. All right. All right, excellent. Now, we can do that artificially by putting it into our blood that way, but there is something that uh, endurance athletes can actually do to improve the oxygen carrying capacity of their, um, of their blood. And what is it that they do? Altitude training. Exactly. They do altitude training. Instead of riding their little bicycle around here in Davis, they go up to Denver and do it there as well, right? Uh, the advantage is the altitude. In at altitude, what happens is the lower atmospheric pressure, when you take in a liter of air into your lungs, that liter of air that you take into your lungs doesn't have as much gas in it because the gas is spread out more because of the lower atmospheric pressure. So less oxygen gets into your uh, lungs, which means less oxygen gets into your blood. Your kidneys, as we talked about, uh, monitor that, send out a hormone that tells your body to make more red blood cells. And as a result of that, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, we're trying to run heck. You get tired just walking up the stairs in Tahoe. It's brutal. Uh, my first uh, Tough mutter I did up actually at Tahoe and that was a brutal experience. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, so absolutely that higher altitude. So what they do is they go and train there increase in their hematocrit and endurance athletes typically are allowed to have a slightly higher than average uh, hematocrit as a result of that. Uh, in, uh, in Tahoe, Ash or somewhere else? Oh, very cool, awesome. That should be fun. It's a, uh, it is definitely a bonding experience. Hopefully you're doing it with the group. That's the only way to do it. All right, excellent. So, our blood vessels, pardon me, our red blood cells are big bags of hemoglobin. As such, they only last for about 100 to 120 days. However, it's a very active 120 days. During that period of time, our red blood cells travel around 700 miles. So they're putting in the time. Of course, because they're just big bags of hemoglobin, they don't have organelles, they don't have nuclei, they don't have DNA, they can't repair themselves or make new organelles or anything along those lines. So we have to constantly make more. Now, the process of hematopoiesis is the formation, and let's again, we wanna be careful with our definitions of all of the blood cells. And of course, the process of making new red blood cells would be the process of erythropoiesis. Now, of course, in an embryo, we are constantly making massive numbers of red blood cells. In fact, embryonic blood has a much higher hematocrit than a typical adult blood does. Uh, there's a massive need of oxygen, a massive amount of growth, a massive amount of metabolism. And so it's not surprising that we produce blood from a massive amount of locations. In an embryo, uh, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets can be formed in the yolk sac, the liver, spleen, thymus, lymph nodes, and of course the red bone marrow. 
In an adult, where do we make our formed elements? Bone marrow. Yeah, but where is that bone marrow? What type of bone marrow and where is it located? Long bones. Okay, the entire long bones filled with bone marrow? Yeah. Uh, it's the innermost, uh, I forget the term. So let's think about it. So how many different flavors does bone marrow come in? Two, what are they? Yellow and red bone marrow. Yellow and red, excellent. Now someone mentioned a long bone, so let's go ahead and draw one. And again, we'll just draw a Dino one here because again, it's convenient. Where are the spaces where we find the bone marrow inside of this bone? The very middle. All right, in the diaphysis, which is uh, that hollow middle region there. Any idea what, anyone remember what we call that region in the middle? Medullary cavity. Excellent. And that medullary cavity in a mature adult has what type of bone marrow in it? Yellow. Yeah. We have yellow bone marrow inside that medullary cavity, right? All that adipose that lightens the weight of the bone, cushions the bone on the inside, but that lightens the weight. So then where's the red bone marrow? On both of the sides. True, in the head. The Although wasn't there an, a, an appropriate anatomical term like diaphysis for the heads of the bones? Epiphyses, excellent. Epiphysis being singular, epiphyses being the plural. Remember, this is where we found that spongy bone. We don't have a big medullary cavity. We have all the trabeculae forming those cavities. And within those epiphyses is where we find our red bone marrow. So in an adult, we find our red bone marrow in the epiphyses of our long bones in our short bones, in our, our regular bones, in our flat bones, places like that is where we find our red bone marrow. So not all the bone marrow is red bone marrow, but right, those are the places where you find them. So if anybody here has ever donated red bone marrow before, first, thank you. It is an incredibly generous gift to give, and it's an incredibly painful process. They take an incredibly large gauge needle and insert it typically either into the head of the femur, the proximal epiphysis of the femur, or into the oscoxa to then extract out the bone marrow from that. And even though it's a very large bore needle, it sometimes takes three, six, 12 insertions of that large gauge needle to get enough bone marrow for the uh, for the donation. Exactly. It is absolutely positively not fun in the least, which is one of the things that makes it such an incredibly generous gift to be able to give. Uh, I don't know the gauge of it, but it's uh, it's pretty much the size and diameter of like a quarter, it feels like when you uh, when you look at it. <laughs> no, it's not quite that big, but I, I don't know the gauge, but it is a large gauge, a uh, very large gauge needle to be able to do that. It is uh, quite a, uh, an impressive process. How long does it usually take to replace that, though? Uh, well, one of the reasons is that it, it, uh, my guess is that it would take uh, weeks to months, probably not more than probably six to eight weeks would be my guess. One of the reasons for that is in our red bone marrow, first of all, it is very well vascularized. There's a lot of blood supply in there. And as we know, the more oxygen, the more blood supply, the faster the metabolism of it. However, the other reason, and here's the key, that's a great question leading into what we're gonna talk about now, is in the red bone marrow, we have these pluripotent stem cells called hemocytoblasts. Now, someone remind me again, what the definition of a stem cell is? Oh, that can differentiate in a specialized cell. Okay, well, let's be careful about differentiation. So that is, so that is one of the reasons why I want to make sure we go over this. So go ahead. Cell cell on new cells. Okay, excellent. So, and again, you are right. It is a cell that divides rapidly, or we can be fancy in the way of saying it. It is highly mitotic. 
or if we want to be really fancy, we can say that it spends little to no time in the G0 state. If you think back to when we learned about our cell cycle, right? Basically, this cell goes through interface, preparing for divide, goes through the mitotic phase, and then pretty much goes right back into dividing again. And so that's really the key. Those are all fancy way of saying that it a cell that divides rapidly, right? However, if this is a cell that's pretty much its only job is to divide, then it really doesn't have any other jobs, right? It's basically undifferentiated. It means it doesn't have a job. Like it's like a millennial, right? It doesn't really have a job, just sits around, but it divides very, very rapidly. Excellent. Now, there remember are three main types of stem cells. The stem cells in your skin provide millions of new cells every single day, but how many different types of cells can those stem cells in your skin become? Can they become liver cells or eyeball cells? No, they can only become skin cells. One and one thing only that they can become. Remember, those are what we call unipotent stem cells, exactly. These hemocytoblasts in our red bone marrow are pluripotent stem cells. What does that mean? They can become many different types of cells, but not all. Exactly. So they can become a small subset but not all. In fact, these hemocytoblasts are capable of becoming any of the formed elements associated with the blood. Professor, can you scroll down a little bit? I'm sorry? Uh, could you scroll down a little bit? Uh, I. Can you not see the bottom of the screen? I don't have any way of scrolling. This is just all on the slide. I can move the writing up higher, but I can't. Uh, I can't. I don't have the means of scrolling the screen up or down. If you if you hit the Alt button, it can remove all those side stuff like that bottom bar. If you're in full screen mode, if you hit Alt, it'll remove that bottom bar. Ah, okay, excellent. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Can form any of the formed elements associated with the blood. But for instance, it can't become a skin cell. All right. These hemocytoblasts, and here I have a pretty picture that shows this. These hemocytoblasts are what we call our primary stem cells. So the good news is on the exam, I'm going to be showing you either models or illustrations or most likely histology slides of blood. And notice as you look at the bottom of this illustration, I could point at a red blood cell, a thrombocyte, any of the leukocytes, and I could ask the question to identify the primary stem cell. And so when you look at a slide, and you see, identify the primary stem cell of the formed element, do you even have to look at what the arrow is pointing at? Well, I'm asking the question, so what's the obvious answer? Hematophys, yeah. No, because every single formed element has the exact same primary stem cell. This hemocytoblast is what is responsible for forming all of the formed elements. So if I'm pointing it at a erythrocyte, it came from a hemocytoblast. If I point it at a thrombocyte, it came from a hemocytoblast. If I point at a basophil or a monocyte or a neutrophil, they all come from a hemocytoblast. It is the primary stem cell of all formed elements. Come on, there we go. However, if you look more closely at this flow chart, when the hemocytoblast divides, really it only produces one of two things. 
either a lymphoid stem cell or a myeloid stem cell. These two are what we call secondary stem cells. Every single formed element in your body has both a primary and a secondary stem cell. Again, remember we talked about this hemocytoblast is a pluripotent stem cell. And let's look at the myeloid stem cell. The myeloid stem cell, how many things can it produce? More than one. More than one. So it is also a pluripotent stem cell. But what about the lymphoid stem cell? How many things can the lymphoid stem cell form? So just one? Just one. So it is a unipotent stem cell. And because at this point there is one thing and only one thing it could become, we also refer to this as a committed cell. Because at this point, the ultimate uh, destination of this, what this is going to produce has finally been determined. If you're a lymphoid stem cell, you basically can produce one thing and one thing only. And that one thing and one thing only you can produce are lymphocytes. Notice the same is not true for the myeloid. Myeloid stem cell can still become numerous things. But eventually, it will form a committed cell as well. So on the exam, not only do you need to recognize the formed elements, and I think I told you guys this at the end of last class, not only do you need to be able to recognize the formed elements, not only do you need to know the function of the formed elements, but you also need to know the primary and secondary stem cells of all of the formed elements. And while that sounds scary, it's not because how many right answers are there for primary stem cells? One. One. How many right answers are there for secondary stem cells or possible answers are there for secondary stem cells? Two. Mm -hmm. And if you had to guess, which one should you guess? Myeloid. Myeloid. Myeloid, exactly. Because of the seven things that can be formed, six of them come from the myeloid stem cell. So if you really don't know, guess myeloid. But hopefully you can easily recognize a lymphocyte if you can easily re recognize a lymphocyte, then it obviously comes from the lymphoid stem cell. The name makes it pretty easy. And then if it's not that, you know it must be mine. Well, we now, don't need to know everything in between though, correct? Well, yes and no. Let's talk about, so I did this, we did that. Uh, move this out of my way. Oh, actually we asked this question first. If this one, the hemocytoblast, if the myeloid stem cell are both pluripotent and can become numerous things, what determines what they become? Hormones. Hormones, exactly. This process is driven or determined by hormones. Now, let's look at one of these pathways the pathways associated with erythrocytes. For this pathway, to answer your original question, yes, you need to know all of the intermediate steps as well. Although I will warn you right now for the uh, leukocytes, uh, I won't hold you responsible. For the thrombocytes, I won't hold you for the, all the intermediate pathways. But this is an important pathway with some important things going on. And so these are some things we want to talk about. So. We are going to talk about the process of erythropoiesis. Erythropoiesis is specifically formation of the red blood cells. And again, I'm specifically saying red blood cells here 
because urethro is for the erythrocytes is in the name. And I don't like using the names, the definitions. Building is not tall because it is tall. So this is a process of the formation of the red blood cells. And remind me again, what is our primary stem cell? Metacytoblast. Hemocytoblast. There we go. What is our secondary? Myeloid stem cell. There you go. Myeloid stem cell, excellent. So we know those, make that a little bigger. There we go. Excellent, that's the first thing we need to know. We've done that. Now, from there, eventually remember, as we talked about, it is gonna become what we call a committed cell. This committed cell is a unipotent stem cell. And again, what makes it committed is the fact that it's unipotent. At this point, there is one thing and one thing only it can make. And so our committed cells in this process of erythropoiesis are what are known as pro-erythroblasts. Pro, of course, means before. Erythro refers to the erythrocytes. And a site, of course, is a mature cell. But as we learned in 430, a blast is an immature cell. And blasts are uh, charged with the process of building. B for blast, B for build. These proeurythroblasts then divide to form our immature red blood cells. Now, I know color is often one of those things we don't worry too much about because often that color is an artifact. Remind me again what an artifact is? A non sequitur. True, it could be, but in the case when we're talking about histology, when we're looking at things under the microscope, what do we mean when we use the term artifact? It looks that way on the slide, but that's not necessarily its physical representation in the body. Excellent. That is a perfect way to describe it. Remember, when we're looking at tissues, one of the things we have to do is first cut that piece of tissue out. Then we typically freeze that piece of tissue. Then we use a very sharp blade to shave off the tiniest amount, 30 micron sections of that. We put it in all sorts of different chemicals. We then put it on a slide, put some glue on top of it and slap it. And that process changes the tissue. Right? What stain you use can change the color. So color is often one of those things we don't pay too much attention to, except when it's important. And notice this is one of the times when it's important. This immature red blood cell isn't red. It has a nucleus and it has a very dark, deep purple coloration. The reason it has this purple coloration to it is because it has this massive amount of flattened interconnected plasma membranes with these tiny bumps on the surface. What did I just describe? Ethical or Golgi body? Okay, Golgi bodies definitely have flattened uh, membranous sacs in them, uh, those sternae that we learned about in 430, but they're typically not interconnected, and they also typically don't have tiny bumps on the surface. There we go. Uh, of course, remember, uh, Allison, no abbreviations. So what does RER stand for? Rough of the reticulum. There we go. A massive amount of rough endoplasmic reticulum. And someone remind me again what rough endoplasmic reticulum does? Synthesizes proteins. There we go. Makes proteins. 
So obviously, if we have a massive amount of rough endoplasmic reticulum, we have this cell, this early erythroblast, can make massive amounts of protein. And which protein do you think we're going to start making a massive amounts of? Globulin portion of hemoglobin. Yeah, we're making the hemoglobin. Exactly. So this purplish coloration comes for two reasons. One, it has a massive amount of rough endoplasmic reticulum, which stains more purplish like this. And it doesn't have any hemoglobin yet. Nothing to bind the oxygen. Notice as it matures from an early erythroblast to a later erythroblast, we see a color change it starts to become more and more pinkish in color as it fills with more and more hemoglobin. Until finally it reaches a critical amount of hemoglobin. Once it makes reaches this critical amount of hemoglobin, it matures into a cell we call a normoblast. And this normoblast makes a very important decision. It decides, hey, you know what? I am so filled with hemoglobin at this point. I really don't need all of these other organelles like a Golgi apparatus, like a smooth endoplasmic reticulum or a rough endoplasmic reticulum. And I don't need this nucleus either. And so basically it chucks, it releases uh, via exocytosis, the nucleus and most organelles. Now, this is not that programmed cell death that we've talked about before. What was that process called again? Apoptosis. Say again. Apoptosis. Exactly. It's, this is not apoptosis. Absolutely. Right. The cell isn't dying, at least not right away. When you release your nucleus, when you release most of your organelles, again, you're not going to be able to repair yourself. You're not going to be able to continue to metabolize things. So eventually you're going to die. But this is not that apoptosis, but it is similar in that basically it ejects all of its contents except for that hemoglobin. And when that occurs, basically it becomes a special cell called a reticulocyte. And it is as this reticulocyte that the cell is released from the bone marrow into circulation. And how would we get this formed element into a blood vessel in that bone marrow? If only there were special types of capillaries that had enough gaps and spaces in their incomplete epithelium to allow something as large as the formed element to get into it. A sinusoid? Yeah, there you go, excellent. So at this point, they enter the circulation as reticulocytes. And at any one time, they make up somewhere around, oh, I don't know, one and a half percent of our circulating red blood cells. Why might that number be useful to know? Again, I'm not saying why do you have to memorize one and a half percent, but if you had a patient that you were monitoring, why might it be useful to know what the percentage of reticulocytes in their blood might be? To understand if they're... Go ahead, Daniel, say again. To understand if they're producing um, red blood cells appropriately. Right, Not so yeah, absolutely. If it's immediately after surgery, you might expect that number to be higher 
However, if you're a week out of surgery and that number had been slowly and steadily decreasing, and then suddenly that number jumped up again, what might that be an indication of? Bleeding? Bone marrow infection. It could be a um, uh, bone marrow infection or cancer could be one thing, or a, another very good example might be internal bleeding. If suddenly they popped a suture or something and there was some type of internal bleeding and they were losing blood inside, your body would try to compensate by making more. So if you see a sudden spike in a recovering patient of the percentage of reticulocytes, that can be an indication of internal bleeding. They enter the blood as these reticulocytes, but after a couple days, they then mature into our erythrocytes. So to answer the original question, this pathway, the step-by-step the -step process of erythropoiesis is a process that we need to know all of the intermediate steps of. We need to know not just the one, but both. And again, that's the one thing our picture here is lacking. We need to know both the primary and secondary stem cells that then become the committed cells, which produce the immature cells, which then make uh, hemoglobin until the cell reaches a critical point where it chucks its nuclei, becoming an immature big bag of hemoglobin released into the blood where it matures into a mature big bag of hemoglobin. Questions on this process? All right, so again, we did that, 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 we did that. And again, we're doing a lot of this. About 2 million reticulocytes are being released into your bone, uh, into your blood every second, which means you're breaking down about 2 million red blood cells about every second as well. And like we said, it makes up around one and a half, one to one and a half percent of your circulating red blood cells. And again, for an exam, these numbers aren't numbers that are necessarily important. Like I said, very useful for wooing women. Walk up to a woman at a bar and say, hey, did you know you're making 2 million reticulocytes every second? And they make up about 1% of your circulating red blood cells. And they just swoon uh, when you say that. But uh, again, it's more about understanding how these numbers would change in relationship to an injury or surgery or something along those lines. Uh, depends on the blood cell count. Now, Sarah, it works. I tell you, I, every week I'm getting women that way. That's exactly my pickup line. It works tremendously. Yeah. Um, so it depends on the red blood cell count, but absolutely some uh, blood counts, some you're just looking at the hematocrit, some you're looking at a, a differential, uh, but with a complete blood panel, typically you will get reticulocyte counts on that but it depends on the type of test. All righty. Excellent. So where are we? You know what? It's a little, I wanted to be a little further along, but this is a good natural stopping point. And since we don't have as much stuff to, to cover today, I think let's go ahead and take our first break now because I want to spend a little bit more time on this control of this uh, process. So let's go ahead, I'll come back to this here. And let's go ahead and take our first break at this point. We'll take a 15 minute break. Uh, come back at 930. And I will start the recording at that point. All right, any other questions before we take our first break? All right, see you guys in 15 minutes. Excellent. So any questions on that?
Oh, and of course, the other thing that you missed is uh, Sarah uh, warned the guys not to use my pickup lines. But uh, again, who knows women better, a woman or a fat old bald guy? I mean, really, that my, listen to my pickup lines because they'll, uh, they'll help you every time. All right, excellent. Questions on any of that? All right, excellent. So now that we know how to make a red blood cell, let's talk about when and why we would do this. As we talked about, as we talked about um, the main factor that is gonna determine production of red blood cells is the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Right. Our goal, remember, we talked about before, and we talked about this in terms of circulation before, but it's still the same. The goal is to meet the needs of the tissues. It's too big, so let's make that smaller. If we are not able to meet the needs of the tissues, then basically the tissues undergo hypoxia or become hypoxic. And again, as we talked about, circulation can be an issue if there's a problem with the heart where it's not uh, pumping properly or a blood vessel blockage. As we talked about anemia, you don't have enough blood volume, you don't have enough red blood cells, you don't have enough hemoglobin in those red blood cells. We even talked about high, high altitude, right? They pump less oxygen up at, 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 uh, at altitude, so you get less oxygen in a single volume of blood, I mean of air, and so there's less that way. All right, someone holding a bag over your head. There's all sorts of numerous reasons why you're not getting enough blood to your tissues. And as we talked about before, one of the main locations where we monitor this are the kidneys. There is a massive amount of blood going to the kidneys. 25% of your blood is being sent towards your kidneys while you're sitting here calmly at rest. So when the kidneys notice a drop in um, oxygen carrying capacity of the blood, they produce and release a hormone called erythropoietin. And of course, this erythropoietin is going to target the uh, red bone marrow. And this erythropoietin basically has two main effects. The first of these effects is that it is going to encourage the hemocytoblasts to form more myeloid stem cells. And of course, have those myeloid stem cells become more of the proerythroblasts. So again, we could sum this up in basically saying that it causes more red blood cells to be made. But the other thing that it does is it speeds up hemoglobin formation. So not only do we make more red blood cells, but the red blood cells mature more rapidly. So we get more red blood cells and we get them faster, right? So those are going to be the two keys to that urethropoietin. We get more pro fat blasts and they develop faster into reticulocytes. And I'll erase my writing so that we can see the pretty picture here from your textbook. We have an imbalance, a drop in oxygen. Our kidneys release the erythropoietin, which goes to the red bone marrow, giving us more red blood cells more quickly, increasing the oxygen carrying capacity, and the body is back into balance. All right, questions on that?
All right, with that, that is pretty much everything we want to know about red blood cells for now. So we can switch gears and talk about our white blood cells, the leukocytes. We have far, far fewer of these. Remember that single drop of blood that had 5 million red blood cells in it only has five to 10,000 white blood cells in it. Now, obviously we have far more red blood cells than we do have white blood cells. But the other reason those numbers are so low is because in a healthy individual, at any one time, only about 2% of their leukocytes are in circulation, are actually in the blood. The other 98% are housed in other tissues or other fluids, like our lymphatic fluids, like in our lymph nodes, like in our spleen, our skin, our lungs. Of course, this is in a healthy individual when an individual becomes sick, and we'll talk about this process a lot when we get to the immune response in the next section we have the ability to mobilize these cells and bring them into circulation. So one of the things that we talked about earlier and we'll talk about again is when you're doing that differential blood cell count, uh, that differential blood cell count, one of the things you look for is not just the overall number of white blood cells, but what type of leukocytes you have there as well, because that can give you some indication of what's going on inside that person's body. Now, as we talked about, leukocytes come in two flavors, granular sites and agranular sites. Granular sites are granular in nature because they tend to have more distinct uh, large vesicles inside of them that we call granules. Notice here are the three main types, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Now, while both of the, all, both all three of these do have granules, you see there are some key differences between them as well. Let's start with the neutrophils. Neutrophils are by far the most common type. There are some key characteristics that will allow you to help to distinguish them. Notice they're about twice the size of a typical red blood cell. But what you really notice and that should be very distinct is it has very clearly a multi-lobed nucleus. This is not more than one nucleus. This is a single nucleus that has multiple lobes to it. It has a relatively clear cytoplasm with smaller distinct granules inside of it. These neutrophils are our first responders. These are the ones when there's first an injury or first uh, an inflammation or, or an illness or something like that are the first ones to respond. And when they leave the blood vessel, and one of the key things to leukocytes is all leukocytes can leave the blood vessels. So one of the keys of these is they can all leave blood vessels. But when these leave the blood vessels and become activated, they become our phagocytes. What are phagocytes? Cells, uh, large cells. Cells. Yeah, these are the cells that are responsible for finding foreign, abnormal, dead or damaged cells and basically, or, or other materials, viruses, things along those lines, and breaking them down. They engulf them, they bring them in, and they break them down into bits. That neutralizes that whatever harmful pathogen might be. It recycles the bits so that they can be used in the healing process and the growth process. And they can also be used to help to stimulate our immune response, provide a warning to the body of what's going on, right? Again, your lab manual, pardon me, your textbook with the master and e &P, 
Uh, again, I forced you to do that interactive physiology exercise. When we get to the next section with the immune response, the uh, interactive physiology has a great tutorial where they use the example of uh, a castle and our defense of the castle uh, as that uh, analogy for our immune response. And it's an excellent, excellent example of it. It's a really useful tutorial if you have problems with those things. And what I always imagine in this, if your job is to protect your castle and someone comes in and tries to steal something from you, not only do you kill that thief, but the other thing you do is you take that thief's head and you put it on a stake outside of your castle, all right? That acts as a warning to the others, uh, thieves, so that they won't come around. And it lets people know, hey, there's thieves around right now. We got to be on the lookout for those. And that's kind of what these phagocytes do as well. They basically gobble up a virus and then hold a piece of it out and go, hey, look what I just gobbled up. These things are running around. We might want to do something about it. So very important, very useful in our immune response. Next is our eosinophil. Notice it also has a multi-lobed uh, nucleus. It also has granules. However, what is distinctly different about this one? It has far more granules. Its cytoplasm looks denser. Yep, and what do you notice about those granules? They're a different color. Yeah, not just a different color, but red. Right? These have very large red granules. Oops. Again, one of those things we keep talking about, color doesn't matter on histology except when it does. And this is one of those times when it does. One of the keys that is very distinct and very obvious and very easy to identify about these eosinophils is they have these bright red, dark, distinct, large granules. Now, these also are phagocytes, uh, but they play an important role in helping us to defend against, uh, in particular, larger parasitic uh, structures like parasitic worms and things along those lines. They play a very important role in helping us to protect our body from that. And then lastly, we have our basophils. As you can clearly see from the picture here, these basophils also have a large multi-lobed nucleus. Can you clearly see the large multi-lobed nucleus? No. No, because these basophils have massively large, very dark, huge granules. We may not be able to see the nucleus. We happen to know what's in there but we may not be able to see it, but it's because it has these massively, massively large, very darkly stained granules that just happen to be chalk filled oops, with histamine. Oops, histamine. Why is histamine so important? Uh, mediates the inflammatory response. Exactly. This plays a huge role in mediating our immune response and particular what component of it? Inflammation. Inflammation. Oops. What are the four cardinal symptoms of inflammation? Redness. Yep, redness. Swelling. 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 Heat. Heat. Pain. Pain. Pain, there you go, absolutely. When we get to our immune response, you'll get to learn the Latin for all of those, but for right now, we can focus on those. Inflammation, uh, heat, redness, and pain. Pardon me, swelling, uh, pain, uh, redness, and heat. Again, the reason for this is what histamine does is it causes blood vessels to dilate bringing more blood to the area. Blood is red, blood is warm. So that's where the redness and the warmth comes from. But it also makes the capillaries leaky. So more fluid escapes from it. The blood vessels become more permeable. Those capillaries become more permeable. So more comes out. And as more comes out, we get that uh, edema, that swelling. 
right? They, those hives that can occur in the skin, for instance, when you get a scratch or something along those lines or rashes like Angela pointed out, absolutely. And of course that swelling can push on the nerves and cause pain, right? Which again is great when you are injured but if it's just that your neighbor is cutting the lawn, right? We can also get an inappropriate activation of these basophils, causing that histamine to be released inappropriately. And what do we typically refer to that as? Allergy. Allergy, absolutely, or hypersensitivity, absolutely. So as a result of that. Uh, yes, Christopher, to answer your question, all of these have a single nucleus, uh, but they all have multiple lobes to them. That is correct. In fact, all leukocytes have just a single nucleus. All righty, uh, clear those. And then we can look at our two agranular sites that are agranular, do not have vesicles in their cytoplasm. The easy of this, these to identify is the uh, lymphocyte. Lymphocytes have a single massive excuse me, nucleus that almost completely fills the cell. Notice we can only see the slightest rim of cytoplasm around it because it has this massive, massive nucleus. These lymphocytes are the ones that are responsible for our, what we typically think of as our immune response. When activated, these are the ones that become our B cells and our T cells that provide us with our immune response. And again, I keep using that term immune response. You do not have an immune system. You have 11 organ systems and immune is not one of them. Systems are comprised of organs working together. Your immune response is a collection of cells and chemicals that are working together to provide protection for you. The last uh, lymph uh, pardon me, leukocyte is our monocyte. Notice the monocyte is the largest of all of our uh, leukocytes. Notice it doesn't have multiple lobes to its nucleus, but its nucleus often takes this kind of a U shape to it. All of these cells tend to have some phagolytic characteristics. Lymphocytes don't, but the other four primarily do have some phagolytic characteristics. However, the neutrophils are the main ones, and then also these monocytes. These monocytes are much, much slower to react. They typically aren't present in an initial infection, but if you have a chronic infection that lasts for a prolonged period of time, you will see a massive increase in these monocytes. And when these monocytes are activated by leaving the blood vessels, they become our macrophages, our big eaters capable of engulfing massive amounts of materials, dead and damaged tissues, uh, infected cells, things along those lines as well. So neutrophils become phagocytes, monocytes become macrophages, our big, big eaters. All right, obviously we'll, we'll talk more about the functions of these cells when we get to our immune response, but we need to be able to recognize them, we need to be able to identify them, we need to know their function, we need to know their primary and their secondary um, stem cells. And remember, at the end of last class, we talked about this pretty picture that uh, we found, I found online many, many years ago that has all of our formed elements in it. We've got too many windows open here. Let me juggle some of this stuff around. So based on what we know, what would this one be? Monocyte. Monocyte? It's U-shaped nucleus. True, but look at this one. Much, much larger as well. Remember the monocytes are typically much, much larger. This one is the same as this one. What are those? Neutrophils. These are the neutrophils. Excellent. This one here. Eosinophil. 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 Excellent. This one here. Basophil. This one here. 
Monocyte. No, this one's a lymphocyte. Remember, the monocyte's going to be the largest. This is by far the largest of the cells. Big, chunky, U-shaped nucleus. Typically, when there's spaces in between, it's because it has multiple lobes. I appreciate this has a little bit of a U-shape, but notice how this one's much larger, much more congested, and just kind of bent over at the middle, whereas this is more elongated. So these are both of those. And again, it's got the smaller granules inside of it. They aren't huge. And again, this isn't the best resolution, but you have that as well. All right, so again, we see all of them there. Uh, again, remember I said the neutrophils are the most common. In fact, there's a great mnemonic to remember that. Never let monkeys eat bananas. Oops. If you can remember those wise words of advice, you will always be remember to remember the most common to the least common of our leukocytes. Neutrophils are the most common, followed by lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. All right. Questions on that? All right, remember we had one other thing that we saw on this slide as well, our thrombocyte. Oh wait, before we get to thrombocyte, here I am not going to hold you responsible for the intermediate pathways and the stages in this process. So you're not gonna need to know the names of any of those or all those types of things. All you need to be aware of is that the myeloid stem cell produces the basophils, the neutrophils, and the monocytes, whereas the lymphoid stem cell is responsible for producing the lymphocytes. So you need to know which secondary stem cell produces which mature formed element, but I'm not going to hold you responsible for the individual stages. And not surprisingly, oops, uh, we'll talk about it later. Hormones. All right, questions on that. All right, excellent. So that leaves us with our thrombocytes. Remember, our platelets are basically a cell fragment. Essentially, what happens is we have a, let's cheat and draw it. There we go, this way. A capillary. And we know that capillary has a bunch of intracellular clefts between the simple squamous epithelial tissues that sit on it, that comprise it. And sitting on top of this capillary is this big, huge, massive cell. And this big, huge, massive cell, and again, this is one of those places where I have to work on my analogies, takes pieces of its processes, pieces of its cell, and basically insert it into these intracellular clefts, into the blood vessel. This is usually when I point out towards Auburn Boulevard and say after class, I recommend that you all go out on Auburn Boulevard, stand on the sidewalk, and then stick your leg out into the street while you stand on the sidelines, on the sidewalk, right? If you were to do that, what would happen? You'd get a job. <laughs> yes, you would. Okay, there no. <laughs> I've never gotten that answer before. That's awesome. You are absolutely correct. Or the other thing that would happen, although I'm not sure you would get a job on Auburn Boulevard, because about how fast do people typically go by on Auburn Boulevard? They'll slow down for that. Maybe. Okay, maybe if you stick out your leg. If I stick out my leg, nobody's, nobody's slowing down. All right. So as the cars go racing by, they're going to rip your leg off. And that's basically what happens here. As the red blood cells travel down the blood vessel, these pieces get ripped off. And so you get this little bit of cytoplasm, right, with these granules inside of it, wrapped up by a little piece of a plasma membrane. And that's basically what happens. This cell gets little pieces of it ripped off by the blood vessels as it goes by, and that's essentially what becomes our thrombocytes. 
Again, in our blood, that single drop of blood, we usually have somewhere between 150,000 and 500,000 of those thrombocytes. And that name of that cell that sits on top of the blood vessel is what is known as a megakaryocyte. Notice, unlike the leukocytes, this one is multinucleated. Or if we want to be fancy, we can say this cell undergoes mitosis, but not cytokinesis. Someone interpret that into normal English for me. What does that mean? It divides, but doesn't split its cytoplasm. Well, it divides what? What divides? If it doesn't divide its cytoplasm, what does divide? It's organelles and organelles. Well, not just any organelle, but mitosis is really the division of what? There you go, Angela's got it, the nucleus. You guys are right. Mitosis, remember, is just the division of the nucleus. Cytokinesis is the division of the cytoplasm. So if you have a cell that undergoes mitosis but under, doesn't undergo cytokinesis, what you end up is one cell with two nuclei. And then if it does it again, you have one cell with four nuclei. And that's what these megakaryocytes are. These megakaryocytes are big, large cells with many nuclei inside of them. And what's the advantage to having a massive number of nuclei? Lots of protein. Well, lots of instructions for making proteins, absolutely. The DNA is the instructions for making proteins. So not surprisingly, this cell makes a massive number of proteins. You are absolutely correct. And that's basically what it does. It makes these massive amounts of proteins, sticks them into their appendages, gets those appendages ripped off and makes platelets. These platelets, thrombocytes, are vital for our process of hemostasis, a sequence of responses that help us to limit and stop our blood loss, maintaining homeostasis of our blood. Again, you are not gonna be responsible for the intermediate stages here. You just need to know that our myeloid stem cell becomes megakaryocytes, which produce our thrombocytes. So this is a name you need to know. You definitely need to know megakaryocyte and obviously myeloid stem cell, but you don't need to worry about any of the steps in between. Now, as we said before, and I'll emphasize again, which path we take what that hemocytoblast makes is all driven by hormone signals, chemical signals. There are all sorts of different types of hormones and other types of growth factors that lead to the differentiation and proliferation, proliferation of our cells. We've already talked about a couple of these. Erythropoietin is a great example of this. It's produced by the kidneys, increases our red blood cell counts, and makes them mature faster. Thrombopoietin is actually released by the liver. The liver is one of those places where, again, we're monitoring and changing the condition of the blood. So if it notices that the platelet count is low, uh, it will release thrombopoietin, which uh, stimulates the production of more megakaryocytes. Now, when it comes to the white blood cells, there is a whole class of hormones. Because remember, we don't want to just produce white blood cells, but different white blood cells are going to serve different functions. So we have this big, huge, massive class of hormones known as cytokines. I know when you take micro, you guys will talk about this in more detail. So I'm not going to go into too much depth on our cytokines. And that will be true also when we get to our immune response. There's some overlap between 431 and micro. So I get to avoid some of the boring stuff and make them do it. But this big, huge class of hormones, and one of the big keys to these are these are actually local hormones. Rather than a typical hormone, we think of being a circulating. Right? It's produced in one part of your body, like your adrenal gland, released into the blood. And once it gets into the blood, where can it go? Everywhere. 
Everywhere, absolutely. In this case, many of these cytokines are smaller, more delicate chemical signals. They're not the kind of thing you want to get into the blood and go everywhere, but they'll be made locally there in the red bone marrow to influence and modify growth and development of which specific cells we want in the bone marrow. So they're much more local hormones, uh, what we call paracrines and autocrines, where they actually either can stimulate themselves or stimulate the cells just in their surroundings. And there's lots of examples. You don't have to memorize all of these, but they include things like colony stimulating factors and interleukins and all sorts of different things. Again, we'll talk about this in some uh, more detail, a little bit more detail when we get to our immune response. But like I said, you'll also get this in micro as well. All right. All right. We do need to spend a little bit of time talking about this process of hemostasis. Again, two days before the exam, I don't want to go into too much depth on this material, but I do want to talk a little bit about it and make sure we know it. There are basically three main steps to hemostasis. The first is what is known as the vascular phase or the vascular spasm. Essentially what happens here is when a blood vessel is damaged, that blood vessel and the chemicals released by that damaged blood vessel causes the smooth muscle to constrict, right? That's why we call it a vascular spasm. What's the advantage of contracting the blood vessel, the smooth muscle? Yeah. Increases resistance, so less blood flows out. Excellent. It does two things. It increases resistance, and it also decreases the lumen. So less blood is lost. Absolutely. So we get more resistance, um, uh, decrease the lumen, so we get less flow, less blood is lost thanks to that. Those damaged, uh, those chemicals released from the damaged tissue also attract platelets to the area. Remember our platelet plug formation is one of those positive feedback mechanisms we talked about way back in 430 that plate the plug formation to form a temporary uh, blockage to the loss of blood. And so that's where our thrombocytes are gonna play an important role. Of course, that is a very temporary solution. So we then need something a little bit more um, long-term and we get that with the coagulation phase where we get our blood clotting. And this is going to involve that important process of bringing those water soluble fibers we talked about out of solution. I think I got a pretty picture here that helps to illustrate these and we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail in just a second, but we get our vascular phase, we get that platelet plug phase and then ultimately our coagulation until healing occurs. Like I said, we're not gonna go massively into depth on these, but we are gonna talk about them a little bit. So let's talk first about the vascular phase. Here we see the simple illustration showing this process. A blood vessel is cut. And as a result of that, the blood vessel constricts that vascular spasm, uh, constricting uh, the lumen, increasing the resistance, decreasing blood flow. This spasm is caused by the chemicals released by the damaged tissue and it is stimulated by our pain receptors in that area, which is a good thing because when that bear with an ax rips my arm off, then that means that all my blood vessels are gonna constrict, I'm not gonna lose blood and I'm gonna survive so I can just finish the lecture and then get that taken care of afterwards, right? No, obviously this is going to work best in our smaller blood vessels. Right? If you uh, cut your femoral artery, you're not going to be able to just rely on the constriction of that blood vessel to stop you from bleeding out. And even in the smaller blood vessels, it only uh, reacts this way for a brief period of time, constricting for only about 30 minutes or so. Now, luckily, that 30 minutes in those small blood vessels is typically enough time for those other processes we talked about to take place. So this is a very simple reflex, right? Pain receptors, chemical signals cause the smooth muscle at the site of the injury to constrict. Again, decreasing uh, blood flow, 
increasing resistance, decreasing the loss of blood. Now, those same chemical signals from the damaged tissue will also attract platelets to the area. Now we talked about how platelets have a lot of granules in them, but we didn't talk too much about what type of granules are inside of them. And as it turns out, there are primarily two types of granules found inside of a platelet. The first are what are known as alpha granules. These have things like the clotting factors. These have the platelet-derived growth factor. And this platelet-derived growth factor basically does two things. It causes the proliferation and repair of the tissue. But this is also what helps to attract other platelets to the area as well. Well, I keep not getting that last E into platelets. There we go. As we already talked about, this is a positive feedback mechanism. With a positive feedback mechanism, what is the goal of a positive feedback mechanism? I think I did For it to increase uh, its own stimulus. Right, absolutely. Normally, there is a disturbance. And when we think about the disturbance, for instance, as we saw a drop in oxygen level in our blood, we want to cancel or negate that disturbance by bringing oxygen levels back up. So there's a disturbance and we cancel it. In this case, there is a disturbance, but in this case, we want to enhance the disturbance. Now, while we are enhancing the disturbance, our goal is still the same. Our goal is still to establish or reestablish homeostasis. Well, how do we do that when we're enhancing the disturbance? Because here's what happens. When there's damaged tissue, our platelets come and they attach to that damaged tissue. When they attach to that damaged tissue, they're going to swell become more spiny with their, uh, with their uh, cytoskeleton inside, and they are going to release these alpha granules. Really, they really release all of their granules, but right now we're talking about the alpha granules. These alpha granules then attract more platelets to the area, and more platelets attach, and more platelets lease, release their granules. Notice we've just enhanced the disturbance. Right? There was chemical signals, and now we're releasing more. And even more platelets come, releasing even more chemicals, attracting even more platelets, releasing even more chemicals, and bigger and bigger and bigger, until there's so many platelets in that area, we've basically blocked off the damaged blood vessel, and we stop losing our blood. We've reestablished homeostasis. So our goal here is to bring so many platelets to the area, we form this platelet plug, that stops the blood loss. And these alpha granules help in that tremendously. Of course, this type of activity and also the healing of the tissue require a lot of resources. So not surprisingly, our platelets provide many of those resources as well. It brings energy molecules in the form of ADP and ATP. Calcium, as we know, makes cells do wonky things, and healing is definitely a wonky process. All right? And all sorts of other enzymes and chemicals that are necessary for regulating and enhancing the healing of our tissue. Again, we did this, but we'll do it again. Platelets attach to the damaged epithelium have that releasing reaction, they become spiny, they swell, they release their contents, and those alpha granules attract more platelets until we get that sealing. And again, this works best in our smaller blood vessels. A platelet plug is not going to stop blood loss in your femoral artery. But that paper cut on your finger, this type of thing is perfect for
again, we are enhancing the disturbance, but our goal is to reestablish homeostasis. For the example of if you cut your femoral artery, will this still try to do this? Sure, you would, still, you would still have platelets that attach to the area. You would still have a, a spasm of the smooth muscle. However, the problem is the pressure in the uh, femoral artery is so great that it is going to basically be forcing blood out, even though the blood vessel is constricting. It's not going to allow enough platelets to congregate in that area to stop the blood loss because of the high pressure, right? If on the other hand, you were to cut your femoral vein, right? Obviously you're not dealing with the large pressure. So you would, and we know that the blood moves slower in a veins, but remember also it has a massive size lumen. So even though the pressures might not be as great, you're not gonna be able to form a plate, the plug that's gonna be big enough to seal off that massive uh, vein. So again, and again, it'd be very challenging to cut one of these without cutting the others. But if you were to surgically go in, right, in a saw type situation and just cut the femoral vein, the person would still bleed out a lot slower, but these processes still aren't gonna be sufficient to stop that blood loss. All right, questions on that? All right, that brings us to our third phase, our coagulation phase. This is another one of those perfect examples where your book actually does an amazing job of, of describing the cascade of events that take place in this process. Now, what do I mean by a cascade of events? A clotting cascade. Yeah, but what does the term cascade actually mean? One thing falls onto another, onto another. Yeah, I always think of them in terms of dominoes, right? You hit the first domino, it hits the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth, right? You have a series of events that work together. Your book does a great job of describing this series of events. If you're interested, knowledge for knowledge's sake, I strongly encourage you to read it, but I'm not gonna hold you responsible for the specific steps in this process uh, on this exam. So you're not responsible for that information on the exam, but it is, if it's something that interests you, it's a beautiful process and your book actually does a nice job of describing. Now, coagulation does not occur in a vacuum. There are a lot of things that are required, uh, vitamin K, calcium, some liver enzymes, other chemicals that are released by the platelets and or the damaged tissue. And while I'm not gonna hold you responsible for the cascade of events, it is important to know that there are two separate pathways that are involved in this. The two separate pathways are what are known as the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathways. Let's take a look at the pretty picture here and we can see and get a better sense of what this means. Notice with the intrinsic pathway, this intrinsic pathway basically involves Our intrinsic pathway basically involves uh, materials from inside of the blood vessel. This can be signals from the endothelium. And from the platelets. On the other hand, our extrinsic pathway, as you can see, involves basically chemical signals from the damaged tissue. And even though it doesn't uh, emphasize it here, this is also uh, can be some nervous uh, influence as well. That nervous system communication can cause this as well. Now notice, Again, you see the beauty of this cascade effect, right? As you can see, protein 12 is activated into protein 12A, which is an enzyme that converts uh, 11 into 11A and so on and so forth. And again, I'm not interested in you understanding the activation of all these proteins and all these enzyme chemical reactions. However, notice that the goal of both pathways The goal of both pathways are the same. 
Remember, one of the things that we talked about that makes a blood a connective tissue is that it has waterable, water soluble proteins. And one of the primary water soluble proteins is fibrinogen. Well, in both the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways, the goal is to convert that water-soluble fibrinogen into the water-insoluble fibrin. And that fibrin then produces a massive mesh-like net. All right? Back in ancient times, and by ancient times, I mean the 80s, right? They had these big, huge fishing uh, ships that were all interested in collecting tuna. Because tuna, after all, was the chicken of the sea. And it was a big, huge thing. We had to get lots of tuna for Charlie. And so they would use these big, huge, massive nets that would basically, and they would go to where the schools of tuna were. And they would basically scoop up those schools of tuna with these big, huge, massive nets. And what was the problem with using those big, old, massive nets? Caught more than just tuna? It caught more than just tuna, right? There were mermaids in there and ugly fish that nobody cared about, but there were also the really cute dolphins that would get caught in there as well, because dolphins like to eat tuna. And because dolphins are cute, people cared about them, right? They didn't care about all those other fishes that were being destroyed, but the cute ones, we can't have that. So then there was this big, huge boycott on tuna, right? And then tuna, a dolphin-free tuna became a big, huge, important thing and all those kind of things because it basically caught everything. And that's what we want here. We want this big, huge, massive mesh net that is going to catch everything, not just the pathogens, not just harmful things that way, but blood cells, dolphins, all those things are going to get caught in there, become this big, huge, massive stuck structure, becoming that blood clot. And not only does that blood clot stop the loss of blood, but the other thing that happens with that fibrin is that the fibers stretch out. And as they stretch out, they dehydrate until they form this basically rough hardened cap on top of the injury. And what do we call that rough hardened cap on top of the injury? Scab. A scab, absolutely. And that scab provides some protection while the healing goes on underneath. Here, we see that fishing net, all that fibrin, collecting white blood cells and red blood cells, whatever that white thing is in the middle and all sorts of other things, glopping it together, forming that clot, forming that scab, stopping the blood loss and facilitating healing. All right, questions on that. All right. Then there's one more thing we need to talk about. And I know you had a couple activities on this, but like I said, this is a huge lead in to the things we're gonna talk about in the next section. I have a question about uh, TPA. Yes. So I didn't realize that that like was in our bodies. I thought that was like a totally synthetic thing that's administered. So how, do you know anything about how, like, how they found that or how that was developed for treating clots and strokes? Um, so what I would say, not surprisingly, is there are a lot of characteristics uh, to the blood and things like that that we then use and emphasize to be able to manipulate the body in ways for both good and bad. EPO is another great example, right? There are many conditions, sometimes depending on the surgery, depending on, on the amount of blood loss, people can be given EBO uh, to erythropoietin to help to, uh, to cause more red blood cells to be made more rapidly. Again, it's another way that endurance athletes cheat to be able to do things like that. Uh, many clotting, you know, uh, 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 tocin, right, uh, which is a, a man-made form of oxytocin. There's lots of times where we find these chemical signals. One of the reasons we do all the research we have is the more we understand how the body works, the more we can use that to manipulate it to our needs. 
And so that's what I would say, as we discover these natural occurring things, whether they are within the body or the interaction of our body with other biological things. I mean, how many pharmaceutical companies have spent billions of dollars sending researchers to the rainforests to find all sorts of random chemicals in there that we can then bring back and see how it manipulates and affects the body. So I don't think it's terribly surprising that as the more we discover and, and learn about the body, the more we're able to manipulate it towards our needs. I don't know the you know precisely the story of that one, but I think that it's it's true for that in many things. Yeah. All right. Like I said, the last thing we're going to need to talk about is we need to talk about blood types, how we get blood types, why blood types are significant, and 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 why you can't just scrape blood off of the street and stick it in your arm, right? Although some of you actually can, and we'll talk about that as well. All right. Excellent. Let's go ahead and take, before we do that, one last break. It's 1020, so let's come back at 1035. And at 1035, we will pick up the lecture from here. So we already start at 1035, and then we'll start the recording at that point. All right, excellent. Any questions, any other questions before we take our break? All right, I'll see you guys in 15 minutes. All right, excellent. Before we dive into the new material, uh, there was a quick question during the break about the sinusoid capillaries. Again, remember the sinusoid capillaries were those very loose, very open capillaries allowing large things in and out. So the function of those sinusoid capillaries are to allow the, excuse me, the reticulocytes to enter into the bloodstream. Remember, a, a normal typical, not normal, but a typical continuous capillary just has those intercellular clefts. And even the fenestrations, the holes in a fenestrated capillary aren't going to be big enough to allow something like a formed element like the reticulocyte to get into the blood supply. So those sinusoid capillaries form the spaces that allow those reticulocytes to get into the blood supply. So we're constantly able to add them. And remember, bone marrow is one of the places we said we found those sinusoid capillaries. All right, great question. Any others before we dive back into the new material? All right, the last little bit that we have to talk about is this idea of blood types, right? There are 31 people here in the classroom with us right now, right? And one of the key things that all of us have to be able to do is to be able to recognize the cells that are us versus the cells that are not us, right? Identifying self versus not self. To do that requires two things. The first thing we need is an ability to be able to recognize our own cells. To do that requires us to put special tabs and stuff on the surface of the cells. I think we used the example in this class, right? With a week off after the exam, it's a perfect opportunity to go to Vegas for the weekend, right? And as you're going to Vegas and you've got your black rolling bag and you try to get on the plane with it because everybody's going to Vegas, right? There's not going to be any room to put your bag and they're going to check it. So when you get to Vegas, you get off the, you go to the luggage carousels and how many black rolling bags come off of that carousel at the uh, at, at Vegas airport? Tons. Yeah, tons of them, absolutely. So how do you know which one's yours? By the name tag. Yeah, exactly. You or name tag or other things you put on it to help you to recognize yours. Mine, for instance, I have a big orange bow on mine and a One Direction sticker. Right? And those are the things that help me to be able to recognize that that bag is mine. So having that type of tag on the surface is something that we need on our cells as well. And almost all the cells in our body have these special tags on their surface called antigens. These are mostly proteins, uh, but they can also be lipids or carbohydrates or some combination of those three things. Come on, one D, that, that, that music just doesn't get any better than that, right? And in my heart of hearts, I know they're gonna get back together. All right, excellent. So again, comprised of carb, proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, other components to them as well. But the other thing we need to be able to do 
is recognize tags on cells that are different from our tags. The way we do that is those globulins we talked about earlier, known as antibodies. So antibodies, and we'll talk about this a little bit more uh, in a minute as well, but an antibody is basically a Y-shaped protein. And that Y-shaped protein has a special shaped binding site that can bind to antigens. So let's say for instance, that none of the cells in my body have square shaped antigens ends on them. Then I need an antibody that can find square antigens and bind to it. And basically when it does, it's a flag that waves and say, hey, this isn't belonging to us. This is a cell that is not us and you need to do something about it. And so we need this combination of stuff on the cells and stuff in the plasma of the blood to be able to distinguish them. Now, red blood cells are pretty simple. But even a simple red blood cell has over 30 different types of antigens on the surface. Now, with 31 of us in this classroom, right? And I don't think anybody here is related to each other. Does anybody you think in this classroom have the exact same 30 antigens on their red blood cells as somebody else in this class? No, nobody in this class, even a class this big with 31 students, not that that's a big class, but you get the idea. I guarantee nobody in this class has the exact same 30 antigens. Does that mean that nobody in this class can give blood to anybody else? No. And the reason for that is while there are 30 different types of antigens on a red blood cell, and I know that sounds like a lot, but for instance, if you look at a liver cell, a liver cell has over 200 different antigens on the surface. So 30 is actually a relatively small number. But what's even better than that is the body doesn't respond equally to all 30 antigens. In fact, there are really only two specific antigens that can trigger a severe reaction. And you may not have ever thought of it in these terms, but I absolutely positively know that you guys are aware of this because how many people here know their quote unquote blood type? Anyone know their blood type? Allison, what's your blood type? A positive. A positive, excellent. Uh, Laura, what's yours? Or are you asking a question? Oh, negative. Oh, negative, excellent. Where is, where, did you say you knew your blood vessel or did you have a question? You said who knows their blood types oh, okay. or my perfect. hand. No, that's perfect, excellent. I got a B, uh, I got a B positive, I got an O positive, right? If you notice, there are two key characteristics to the blood type. There is some A, B, O combination of letters which is actually known as the ABO antigen. And there's that whole plus or minus thing. Oops. Anybody know what the plus or minus thing is associated with? The rhesus what? factor. Yeah, the rhesus factor, or what we call the RH factor. Excellent. That RH factor and the ABO antigen, those are the two severe, re, uh, the two antigens that produce a severe reaction. And so when we give someone a blood type, basically uh, we relate their blood type based on those two specific antigens. So let's see how this works. Um, let's do this on the whiteboard. that way, go that way. Red blood cell, red blood cell, red blood cell. Red blood cell. And we'll start first with blue. Let's talk first, oh, actually here, let's cheat a little bit. Move that there, move this here. Here. Shorten that. 
get myself some red root. All right, let's talk first about the ABO antigen. Basically, on your genes, you have the ability to basically produce one of two types of proteins on the surface of our red blood cells. One of those possible shapes, and again, I'm using these as just, these obviously aren't what they really look like, but let's say for instance, one are circles. So one can have circles on the surface and that circle is the A antigen. So we got have an A antigen, which is circles. We could also have a B antigen. And let's say the B antigen is squares. So obviously a person who has a antigens on the surface of their blood vessels, how would we identify that person's blood type? These aren't the trick questions. A. Yeah, their blood type would be A, blood type. Absolutely, as a result of that. So again, I need to, I didn't give myself enough room, so I'll sneak it in. So this one has uh, 18. So A antigen on surface of the blood cell. And so that person we would call blood type A. This person who had the B antigen on the surface, what would we call them? B. This was part of the uh, lab simulators you guys did, right? This sh these should be easier questions to answer because of that. I remember how big it was. B, blood type, that's not big enough, let's go bigger. Excellent, we have our B blood type here. However, it is actually possible for a person to have both squares and circles on the surface of their blood vessels. So their cells express both the B antigen and the A antigen. And how would we refer to these type people? AB. Exactly. These people would be AB blood type. And the fourth possibility is that they don't express either. They express neither A nor B on the surface of their red blood cells. And how would we identify these people? Oh. Exactly, these people would be type O. Notice four possible blood type combinations based on the ABO antigens that they're expressing. So again, they can express, and again, keywords in the sentence, can express, don't have to express, one or more of either the A or B antigen on its surface. All righty. Hopefully that's pretty simple and straightforward. Makes some semblance of sense. Any questions on this? Because if you don't understand this, it's just going to get worse. All 
All right, stunned silence means I completely understand. So perfect, we can move on uh, to the next concept. Now, remember, part of it is having these labels on ourselves so we know what we are. But part of it is also being able to recognize that is stuff that is not us. So the other thing we knew we need our ABO antibodies. Basically in our blood plasma, we can have, can, can, don't have to, one or more antibody to recognize non-us or foreign oops, uh, antigens. So let's think about this. For this person, blood type A, they have circles, the A antigens on the surface of their blood. So what is not them? B and O. They're not O or B or A, B. True. Okay. They're, but they're not remember, B. Does O express anything on their surface? No. No. So what is not them, the thing that is not them, right, the non-self, not them thing is the B antigen. So what these cells need to be able to do is to recognize that B antigen, because if they see that B antigen, they know it's not them. To do that, they need an anti B antibody. Now, remember, as we talked about, these antibodies are these Y shaped, nope. Let's just draw it. Y shaped proteins with a specific binding site on top of them. And what would we want the shape of this binding site to be? Square. Square. Because square is what we're representing B by. So notice this particular blood type has A antigens on their surface and anti-B antibodies in their blood plasma. Excellent. What about this person? What is not them for blood type B? A. A antigen. So therefore in their blood plasma, they need an anti-A antibody. which of course is going to be a Y-shaped protein with what shape binding sites? Circle. Round. Circles around in this case, excellent. So far so good? Excellent. What is not them for this person? Nothing. Nothing, exactly. For this person, there is no not them, nothing. They have both A's and they have B's. So do they need any antibodies? Nope, no antibodies in the plasma. Because A is them, B is them, there's nothing for them to recognize as foreign, so they don't need any antibodies. But what about this person? What is not them for our O types? A and B. A antigen and B antigen. So what antibodies are gonna be needed in their plasma? Anti-A and anti-B. Exactly. So for this person, we are going to need a 
something to protect us from A's and something to protect us from B's. Questions on that? Stunned silence means I understand this material completely. Please continue because it gets harder. Excellent, I will do that. So now let's think about this. For each of these, oh, hold on. We'll get to the positive and minuses in just a minute. We'll get to that in a minute. Because again, that adds yet another layer onto this. And again, I want to build as we're working our way through that. So it's an excellent question. And we will get to the pluses and minuses in a second. But I want to continue to build towards that. So let's just focus on the ABO for right now. But I promise we'll get to that before the end of this. All right. Now, for this individual, who could this person, for everybody, as we've talked about, you have the ability to either receive or give blood. Who could a person who's blood type A, who could they receive from? A and O. You can always get from your own type. So A can always give to A, B can always be, give to B, and so on and so forth. But as you guys pointed out, notice also O could be given as well. Notice O doesn't have any A's on its surface. But that's not what we care about. What we care about is what's not us. Notice anything that had a B antigen on its surface, our antibodies would bind to and wave off a warning. So we can't give them B and we can't give them AB because even though AB has A's on it, it also has B's. This antibody, your antibodies determine which blood you can get. So any blood that doesn't have B, this person can get and that's A and O. So who can this person receive from? And oh, great name for railroad. Who can this receive from? Everybody. Everybody, ready? Obviously always from yourself, but because there's A's on it, they can get it from A, they can get it from B, they can get it from O. Remember, they don't have antibodies. So they can receive from everybody. Whereas this O, who can they receive from? Only O. Only O. Any other blood type is going to have those antigens on the surface and will cause problems. And notice we could flip this around to give. Who can A give to? A and AB. A and AB. Who can B give to? B and AB. B and AB. Who can AB give to? AB and AB. Yeah, just AB. The only person they give to is AB, All right? You can always give to yourself. And who can O give to? Everyone. Everyone. O, A, B, and A, B. Excellent. Oops. There we go. Excellent. All right. Questions on that? Again, stunned silence means you understand it perfectly. Continue on and also make the questions harder on the exam. Excellent. So 
the last layer we need to add on this is remember there's not one but two antigens that cause a severe reaction. The second antigen, as you guys mentioned, is the rhesus or the RH, oops, the RH, RH factor. The RH factor basically can express the RH antigen or not. So for instance, and again, we'll use eh, triangles for nothing better. If you expressed triangles on your surface, How would we identify those individuals? Positive. All right. So this person would be A positive, and this person would be A B positive. And again, they are expressing the RH oops, on the plasma membrane of the red blood cell. And again, that is true for this one and true for this one. Whereas these not expressing how would we identify them? Negative. Excellent. So this person would be be negative, and this person would be O, negative. Now, if you are RH positive, do you need any more antibodies? Do you need to be able to recognize something that is different from you? Yes. Well, but if you have the RH on you, then there's nothing to recognize, you have it. However, if you're RH negative, do you need to be able to recognize that RH because it is not you? Yes. Yeah, so if you're not expressing the RH, then in that case, you need the RH antibody or what we call anti-RH. in the plasma. So for that, we would need our Y-shaped protein with a triangle-shaped binding site. And notice this person also would need So since if you don't express the RH, then you need the anti-RH antibody. If you are expressing the RH, you do not need the antibody because you don't need to recognize it as foreign because it is you. So let's go back now and do this one more time. Uh, let's do it this way. Now that we've added that second component, that RH component to this, who can this person receive from? If you are A positive, who can you receive blood from? Quick. A positive and O positive. A positive and who else? Oh. o positive. O positive. Excellent. Anybody else? A negative. A negative. Anybody else? It's o negative. Exactly. Remember, when determining, and here, let's write this over here. When you determine what blood you can receive, 
it is determined by your antibodies. And there's no reason that this all had to be capitalized. I just guess I had to cap lock on for the A's and B's and all of that. Notice the only antibody this person has is the anti-B. So this person can get any blood at all as long as it doesn't have the B antigen on it. That means they can get A positive, A negative, O positive, O negative. Who you give to is determined by your antigens. So in this case, who can A positive give to? A positive, A, B positive. A positive. Uh, you can only uh, give to O. No, they can't give to O. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, A, B. Yeah. So notice in this case, so I wouldn't say that they're interchangeable, Ash, but it's this way. If you are positive, you can receive both positive and negative. If you are negative, you can only receive negative. So notice A positive can only give to other positive people because anything that doesn't like RH or doesn't like A, it won't be able to give to. So it can give to A positive, it can give to A B positive. Let's do the same thing here. Who can B negative give to or receive from? O negative and B negative. O negative and B negative. Excellent. All right, because who you can receive from is determined by your antibodies. They have the A antibody, they have the RH antibody, so they cannot receive RH, they cannot receive A. So that's O negative and B negative. And who can they give to? B negative and AB negative. B negative, AB negative. Anybody else? Well, I'm pausing, so what must the answer be? Is it B positive? Yep. Why could you give to B positive? Because it already has a factor, so it's not going to have an antibody for someone who doesn't have a factor. Exactly. Remember, who you can give to is determined by your antigens. B negative only has one antigen on its surface, the B. So it cannot give to anybody who has the B antibody. So that would be O minus a negative. That would be A minus a negative. But B negative, AB negative, B positive, and anybody else? AB a, B positive all can receive. Maybe these next two will help us a little bit. Who can receive AB positive blood? Or if you have AB positive blood, sorry. If you have AB positive blood, what blood can you receive? AB positive. All of them. You can always get your own type. Right. Excellent. I heard someone say all of it, and that is 100% correct. However, should you write that on an exam? Absolutely not. You should list them all out. A, B negative. If you have AB positive blood, you can pretty much pick up blood on the street and shove it in your arm and be fine. Well, at least from a blood typing standpoint, right? Pathogens is a whole different story. But, and what would we call somebody with AB positive blood? How would those people commonly be referred to as? Universal, Universal receivers. Universal receivers. Universal receivers. 
Excellent. Which is awesome for you. But what about everybody else? Who can AB positive give to? AB positive. Only themselves. Only other AB positive people. Right? Anybody who has any type of antigen to a blood antigen won't be able to accept their blood. Conversely, instead of selfish people, we have these O negative, which I'm pretty sure, who said they were O negative? Me. Excellent. So when the apocalypse finally hits, we need to all fight over who gets Laura, because who can Laura give her blood to? Everyone. Everyone. A positive, A negative, B positive, B negative, oops, negative. Uh, a, B, positive. A, yeah, A, B, negative. O, positive. And O, negative. If you are O, negative blood, how do we typically refer to you? Universal donor. I am fairly certain you get at least one email a week, if not more from blood banks trying to get some of your blood on bank because basically it can be given to anybody. However, I do not the call, a call list. Yeah, because again, however, the problem with O negative is what can you receive? Only O negative. Only O negative, which is one of the reasons why it is so valuable, not only because it can be used for everybody else, but it's also the only thing that will work for O negative individuals. Yeah, apparently someone else there as well, practically every day. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me at all. All right, and twice a day when there's some kind of, uh, you know, uh, national emergency or something, I bet as well. All okay, right, sir. yes. Is it like O, the most common blood type though? Is that the same with O negative? Uh, so yes, there are, The you are correct. These do indeed vary across populations. And your book actually has a nice chart. I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but absolutely, uh, for, uh, for most uh, populations, O is by far the most common uh, blood type, yes. Now, there are one other implication, and I think someone mentioned earlier, although I closed the chat window by mistake, so I don't remember who said it. Um, one of the concerns with this is if you happen to be, uh, and let's use an example because she pointed herself out, Laura, who is O negative, but let's say that her husband happens to have a positive blood type. That could mean that he could pass that gene on to their child and Laura could be carrying a baby that is positive while she herself is negative. Now, while the blood Exactly. While the blood of the placenta and the blood of, I mean, the blood of the baby in the placenta and the blood of mom in the uterus do not intermix, they do become very, very close to each other. And it is actually possible for mom's anti-RH antibodies to get into the baby's blood supply, which would then cause it to attack baby's blood vessels, and that could be a very, very bad thing. So we need to be able to suppress that reaction. So uh, typically when a uh, negative uh, female is pregnant with a potentially positive baby, uh, chemicals like Rogam can be given to help to suppress that response. Absolutely. All right. I've done an amazing job of drawing this with the pretty pictures, but let's take a look at this from your textbook. Again, there are two key components to this. The first key component, as we mentioned, is that what antigens are on the surface, they use circles for A's and triangles for B's. So if you just have circles, you're A, just have triangles, you're B's, both A, B, neither you're O. But remember, you also have to have the antibodies in your blood plasma to protect you from what is not you. B is not you if you're type A. A is not you if you're type B. If you're AB, everything is you, so you don't have antibodies. If you have O, nothing is you, so you have both antibodies. All right, here's another one. And notice here, we see that nice chart as someone was talking about 
for the blood types. Notice they're not taking RH into factor here, but notice in the white population, about 45% O up to Native American, which is almost 80% uh, blood type O. And so we have these pretty pictures that walk us through this. Now, many of you knew your blood types, but some of you don't, or maybe don't. If you didn't, how would you be able to find out? By doing a blood typing test. Yeah, by doing a blood typing test. Basically, blood typing takes advantage of those antibodies. Let's draw an antibody again. Remember, as I mentioned, an antibody is this Y-shaped protein with two binding sites. The advantage of having two binding sites is it can bind two things. Now, this is not drawn to scale, but I'm going to make this simple. Here is one blood cell. And if that blood cell had that A antigen on it, it could bind to it. But it could also bind to a second blood cell. Now, of course, blood cells have more than one antigen on it. So a second antigen could bind to it, which could hold it to a third blood cell. And notice with these antibodies, not only are these the flags that wave that say, hey, this is abnormal. Hey, macrophage, come and eat this that I'm holding on to. But notice the other thing it does is clump the blood together. This process of using antibodies to clump the blood together is a process we call agglutination. And so we can take advantage of that to determine blood types. We'll start simple. I have two samples of an unknown type of blood. And what I do to one of them, I mix in some anti-A antibodies. Oh, that does not need to be capitals anymore or that big. So in one of them, I add in anti-A antibodies. And I mix it up and I wait to see what happens. And if you think about it, one of two things is gonna happen. The first thing that's gonna happen is nothing. But the second thing that could happen is I could get this big, huge clumping of blood that would occur. This agglutination we talked about. If it agglutinates, what does that tell us? Your blood types has A on it. Absolutely. So again, and be careful with vocabulary, but you absolutely have the right idea. The one thing that this tells us is that the red blood, the, the blood that I have, the blood cells have the A antigen on its surface. Whereas if nothing happens, what does that tell me? There is no A on the surface. Exactly. The blood cells do not have the A antigen on its surface. So that gives me one piece of information, but I need a second piece of information. So luckily, I can also add to a different sample of the blood anti B antibodies. And once again, one of two things can happen. No. Nothing can happen, or I can get a clumping of the blood. Again, if in this case nothing happens, what does that tell me? What's the one thing it tells me? No B surface antigens. Excellent. Blood cells do not have the A antigen on its surface. And if it clumps, if it agglutinates, what does that tell us? That 
And then it does have B antigens on its surface. There you go. The circle above that, was it supposed to be A antigens? Yeah, uh, no, it's supposed to be B, sorry, you are correct. Thank you for catching that. Silly typos are not that big of a deal, but that's a big one. Thank you for catching that. I'm easily confused. Apparently so am I. Excellent. So notice we can put together this combination of information. Open, I guess I have to write back in this one now. Cells do have the antigen on its surface. So by combining this information, we can determine a blood type. Excuse me, Professor. Yeah. So uh, looking at this chart, can the um, clumping of the antigen be like either A or B, or it's just going to be A and then form an, another B? So notice what we have here are two pieces of data. So we can put those two pieces of data together. So. If someone had AB type blood, what would you expect to happen in those two wells of blood? Would they both clump with one clump or the other clump or no clump? They both clump. Exactly. What would you accept to happen, expect to happen with someone who had type B blood? Just B clumps. Just anti B clumps. What would you expect someone who had type A blood? A clumps. And someone had O blood? No clumps. There you go. And notice we could add a third well oops, in this third well if I then added anti RH. And say for this one here, it clumped, what would this person's blood type be? Positive. Yeah, and more specifically, a B positive, right? Whereas if this person's down here didn't clump, what would that tell you their blood type was? Oh, negative. Oops. So using three samples of the blood and three different antibodies, we can tell somebody's blood type. And that's exactly how your blood type was determined. The same way our body can recognize blood cells that are not us, our body can identify other cells that are not us as well. And that's exactly what our immune response is about. I know that the physiox can be a little bit confusing. The, the, the labsters can be a little bit. So that's why I did want to take the time to go over this together to make sure that people understood these concepts. So that's one of the reasons. I know I made you guys do this, but think of it this way. If you did labs about this, and we also talked about it in lecture, it's a pretty important concept. And if it's a pretty important concept, are there likely to be questions on this on the exam? Absolutely. All right. Excellent. Questions on this? Okay, just to be clear with RH. Yes. If the sample clumps with the anti RH serum, mm -hmm. then it is an RH positive sample. Correct. Because what, remember, what you're doing is you're putting in the antibodies to see if the antibodies can bind to the blood vessels or not. So the only thing anti RH can bind to is that RH antigen. So if the RH antigen is there, it's going to bind to it, it's going to clump it together, and we'll know this blood has the RH factor. If it doesn't have the RH factor on it, there's nothing for it to bind to, and it can't clump the blood together. 
So basically we're adding the antibody to see whether or not it can grab onto those handles. So when we add the antibodies, we're looking for the handles, we're looking for the antigens. And whichever one's clump have the antigens. So as we see, this one here had the A antigen because our antibody was able to bind to it. It had the B antigen and it had the RH antigen. So this one was R, it was AB positive. This one, anti-A didn't find anything to bind to. Anti-B didn't find anything to bind to. RH didn't find anything to bind to. So this blood doesn't have the A antigen, doesn't have the B antigen, doesn't have the RH antigen. They were O negative. All right. Excellent. And Allison seems so excited. I'll make sure her test has two questions on this about it. All right, excellent. I meant Sickenberg. Allison, not, not Allison. <laughs> All right, excellent. Questions on that? All righty, excellent. And then of course, we did all of this of who can receive and who can receive what, and we talked about the RH. You should be able to do that on the exam as well. Figure out what someone can receive and what that person can give to. You should be able to do that as well. All right, questions on any of that? This is probably worth saving. So let me do that before I close any of the windows. All right, that is all you need to know for the first exam. So there you go, we have hit the end of all of the new information. Uh, we still have about an hour left in class. So here's what we will do. We will take a quick 10 minute break. I'll give you a chance to, to get together your notes or your questions, get something to drink or eat. We will come back at 11.35. And at 11.35, uh, we will start the question and answer uh, uh, review. So again, this also, for anybody who wants to leave, you're welcome to leave. That's the rest of the new information. Uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have to help to clarify the information to help you to be successful on the exam. So anybody who wants to stay and ask questions is welcome and encouraged to do that. All right. So like I said, quick 10, aim in a break, come back at 11.35 and 11.35, I will answer your questions. So let's actually do this. Let's go back to that there. Oops, go get rid of all that. Now that'll work. So 11.35. I'll see you guys in seven, eight minutes. Let's go ahead and get started. Again, as I said, a review is not me standing here telling you what I think is important. That's what I do every day in lecture. This is your chance to ask questions of me and we will work together to try to come up the answers, make sure that you guys understand this material so you can be successful on the exams. So what questions can I answer for you? Um, can you review the differences between the skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle and conductive cardiac muscle twitch and potential? Sure, absolutely. So, When we are looking at, I guess color doesn't matter, the cardiac contractile muscle cells and the skeletal muscle cells, uh, there are really one, there's two key differences in them, right? Again, for both, we're always measuring voltage versus time. So when we look at skeletal, When we're looking at that skeletal muscle action potential, remember we have a cell that is happily sitting at its resting membrane potential. When it is then disturbed, stimulated chemically or electrically or something like that, we get a very rapid depolarization 
which of course is caused by the opening of those voltage gated uh, sodium channels. However, just as rapidly they inactivate and then the voltage gated potassium channels open and we get a rapid depolarization back to the resting membrane potential. So voltage gated potassium channels open and bring it back down. And again, this takes somewhere on the order of one to, uh, let's say three milliseconds uh, for the entire action potential to occur. Now, with our cardiac contractile cells, it is similar in that, again, we have a resting membrane potential. It is similar in that when disturbed by some type of chemical or electrical signal, we get a rapid depolarization. And that rapid depolarization is again caused by voltage gated sodium channels opening, massive influx of sodium. It also repolarizes with the opening of voltage gated potassium channels, which is gonna cause it to repolarize as well. The big difference between the two is there's this in-between stage with the contractile cells that we call that plateau stage. In that plateau stage, what happens during this phase is basically three things are occurring. Yes, our voltage-gated sodium channels inactivate. which would normally cause it to repolarize. But instead of voltage-gated potassium channels opening right away, potassium permeability actually decreases, which means less potassium leaves. And most importantly of all, calcium channels open, allowing a massive amount of calcium to come in. So yes, no more sodium is coming in, but now calcium is coming in and our positive potassium is not leaving. And so as a result of that, the cell stays depolarized for a much longer period of time. In fact, this action potential can be over 15 times longer than the action potential in our skeletal muscle cell. Do the, um, the potassium ones eventually open? So they just stay closed longer and then and open so later? When the potassium channels finally open, that is when we get the repolarization back down to rest. So it's still those voltage gated potassium channels that eventually open that causes the cell to repolarize. But before they open, there's actually a decrease in their permeability, which helps to keep it depolarized for a longer period of time. And remember, the advantage of this is a longer depolarization gives us a longer excitation, duh. But that longer excitation gives us a longer contraction. Or more specifically, a longer twitch. And again, the reason we want that is we want that more efficient pumping. If you're pumping the blood, you don't want your heart making a bunch of really fast, rapid contractions. You want a full, complete, sustained contraction of the muscle to get that nice, efficient pumping process. And that's good because the cardiac ones don't do the summation, right? So you want the so, prolonged? Exactly. So that leads us to the second thing. I'm not going to bother drawing the twitches because the twitches look the same, just one's longer than the other. But you absolutely have the right idea. The second big difference between the skeletal muscle action potential and the contractile cells action potential is the refractory period. Remember, the refractory period is the amount, is the, what happens is after excitation, there is a period of time where the cell loses its excitability, its irritability. 
basically it cannot be excited again. And if it cannot be excited again, it cannot produce a second action potential. All right. Again, remember, refractory period has nothing to do with the first action potential and everything to do with when we can produce a second. Now, for skeletal muscle, how long is the refractory period? Three to five milliseconds. Yeah. That's a good time. Three to five milliseconds. Notice with our refractory period for our skeletal muscle, basically right after it fires an action potential, it basically can immediately fire an action potential again. And you're correct. That means we can get a second twitch. That means we can sum the waves together, get that wave summation. And we can even tetanize the muscle. However, how long is the refractory period for our cardiac contractile cells? 250? Yeah, around 250 milliseconds. And remember, the contraction itself, the twitch itself, is only around 200 milliseconds. So when our cardiac muscle cell is ready to fire again, is there any tension left to be able to add to the previous one? No. So in this case, because of this, there can be no wave summation. We can't add waves together. We cannot tetanize cardiac muscle, which is a good thing. We don't want it locked up in a prolonged sustained contraction. So we have a longer action potential, which gives us a longer contraction, but we also have a longer refractory period so that it cannot be tetanized. And those are really the big key differences between our skeletal muscle action potential and our con cardiac contractile cells action potential. So notice there are some similarities, but also some differences, which actually makes a really good essay question to write that down. Excellent. I'm just kidding, that's already in the test bank. All right, <laughs> questions on that? Okay, so then the cardiac muscle though also has the conductive cells. Yes. And is the difference in that the slow depolarization? Phases? So again, so great question. So let's do that, let's get rid of this and talk about the cardiac conductive cells. What else can we call these cardiac conductive cells? Autorhythmic. Why do we call these the autorhythmic cells? They can produce their own action potential. Excellent. What is unique about these cells that allow them to produce their own action potentials? No resting membrane potential? Exactly. They have no resting membrane potential. So whereas with our cardiac contractile cell and our skeletal muscle cell, you leave that alone in a Petri dish and provide it with all the oxygen and the nutrients that it needs, they will happily sit there and do nothing, all right? That is not true for the conductive cells. Our conductive cells have no resting membrane potential, so the membrane potential is constantly changing. 
And remember that constant change That constant change in membrane potential has three stages to it. And you know what? I was going to draw it, but since you're not going to be able to draw on the exams, let's just write it out. Now, again, remember this is a cycle, so we could pick it in any order that we wanted. So let's start first with our first phase, that slow depolarization. What causes the slow depolarization? in our cardiac conductive cells. The difference in ions, at least. True. So different ions are moving in or changing the way that they're moving. Which ion in particular is responsible for the slow depolarization? So the voltage- Calcium and potassium. Okay, true, calcium and potassium, but which one? Which one is that? Calcium active? specifically. Okay, I like where you're thinking with that, but I, I, I would argue that while calcium is the key that unlocks the door, which ion actually moves to cause or, or stops moving or moves less to actually cause the slow depolarization? Calcium stops moving. So, and that's why it's slow because it's a plus one versus a plus two. Not a bad guess, but no, in this case, what actually happens is our potassium channels are closing. Now, as someone pointed out, uh, it is calcium gated. So that's why the calcium is important. Calcium is the key that unlocks the door. So as there's less calcium in the cell, our calcium channels are closing but it is those closing of calcium channels, uh, pardon me, a closing of potassium channels that is the key to this, right? When potassium channels close, less potassium leaves the cell. Or you can think of it as more positive ions stay in the cell. And as more positive ions stay in the cell, the cell slowly gets more positive until it reaches some critical point. And what is that critical point? It reaches the threshold. Excellent. And what happens at threshold? Big rapid depolarization. Right, so we're gonna get a rapid depolarization. Why? What happened at threshold? Voltage gated calcium channels closed. Close? Mm. Voltage gated calcium yeah. channels open. And we have a massive influx of calcium giving us that big positive rapid depolarization. Right? Very similar to what happens in skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. We open a voltage gated channel, we get a massive influx of ions and the cell gets more positive. The big difference here is here, instead of sodium, like every other action potential we have ever talked about, in this case, it is calcium that is coming in. And of course, as we know, calcium does wonky things. And in this case, what's the wonky thing that that calcium is gonna do? It opens the calcium gated potassium channels. And when we open those calcium gated potassium channels, which way does potassium, what does potassium do? Leaves. And that potassium leaving the cell through all of the massive openings of those massive calcium gated potassium channels causes our third change in the membrane potential, which is a rapid repolarization. Now remember, repolarization means going back to resting membrane potential. This cell doesn't have a resting membrane potential. So using the term repolarization here is a little bit of a cheat, but it's the term they use in this case. Of course, remember then the problem with this is we pass threshold 
on the way down. And what happens when you pass threshold on the way down? Voltage gated calcium channels close. And as those voltage gated calcium channels close, no new calcium into the cell. And with no new calcium coming into the cell, the calcium already there is pumped out. And as that calcium is pumped out, our potassium channels close. All right, the permeability goes down. And basically, we're back at step one. So basically, this cell continuously cycles three, through these three phases. A slow depolarization, a rapid repolarization, I mean, uh, sorry, a slow depolarization, a rapid depolarization, and then a rapid repolarization, and then slow, and then again and again and again and again, round and around and around she goes. The other important thing about understanding this process is we also know that while these cells do this on their own, their rate of firing can be modified. We can make these cells fire action potentials quicker, or we can make them fire action potentials slower. And which of these three phases do we modify to make it go faster or to make it go slower? The slow uh, repolarization. repolarization. Yeah, the slow depolarization, absolutely. The slow depolarization. This is the one we modify because if we make it reach threshold faster, we have a faster heart rate. If we make it go slower, we have a slower heart rate. And of course, we modify it by using hormones or neurotransmitters to open either typically sodium or chloride channels. Excellent. Great questions. Anything else on this one? All right, perfect. Next question then. When we are tracing a drop of blood, Mm -hmm. um, through a particular path to a particular location. Mm -hmm. Are we assuming that that particular location is where the blood goes through the capillary bed? Yes. Again, is think of it this way. Is there really a functional region of your body that doesn't have capillaries in it? No. So basically any part of the body you go to is going to have a capillary where you can then turn around from. So if I asked you to give me driving directions to your left big toe, to your right ear, to your left spleen, you know, you only have one spleen, you get the idea, uh, to any location in the body, you should be able to, again, only using the blood vessels that are on your list, be able to give me driving directions. And again, like going to the wrist, can there be more than one route that you can take to the palm of the hand? Yeah, even something as simple as whether you decide to go down the radial or the ulnar, you know, uh, artery veins, you can, it, you have even more options coming back. So there definitely can be more than one correct answer to these, but absolutely some of the main parts of the pathway are going to be consistent. So yeah, absolutely. All right. What else? Can you give an example of a route through the systemic system versus the pulmonary? So again, it's all about the location. If, if I, so pulmonary only involves the lungs. So with the pulmonary circulation, there's really only one path. Because remember, it's completely different circulation. You are going from the right ventricle, pulmonary trunk, pulmonary arteries, to the smaller pulmonary branches of the pulmonary arteries in the lungs, right? Going, undergoing gas exchange of the capillaries, the pulmonary capillaries coming back pulmonary veins to the, uh, to the left atrium, all right? 
that's pretty much, there's pretty much only one pulmonary pathway. When we talk about systemic, that basically means anywhere else in the body. So whether like all those examples from your, from your homework assignment, whether it was the right side of the face, whether it's your left knee, whether it's your right big toe, whether it's the liver, whether it's the brain, all of those structures, yeah, heck, even the heart itself, the heart itself we, is its own circulation, that coronary circulation, but it's still considered a systemic circulation in that the arteries are carrying oxygen rich blood uh, to provide oxygen, to provide nutrients and to remove waste. So from things that way. So basically any other destination other than the lungs for gas exchange would be, a, would be considered a systemic pathway. So on the exam, if you give an example of like list this pathway, what is your advice to us to go from one place? Like if you give us a random place, like, uh, like you said, like the toes to something like the heart. Okay. Well, do you have advice for that? So, yes, I actually, I, I have a very important piece of advice uh, because I have graded your guys' cardiovascular exercises. And more importantly, I've been grading the lab exams from my 430 class. The two most important things that are going to get you in trouble on this exam and cause you to lose points for silly reasons is forgetting to say artery and vein and forgetting to say right and left. I would say easily half of the students in my 430 class have lost at least three points or more because they keep getting nickeled and dimed for forgetting right and left. As an instructor, there is nothing more frustrating for me than having you remember that this is the olecranial region and forgetting to say that it's the right olecranial region. Because if you just say olecranial, I can only give you half credit, all right? And there's nothing more frustrating. You got the hard part correct and then forgot the easy part of figuring out whether something is left or right. <laughs> the same thing with the arteries and veins. There's a big difference between the brachial artery and the brachial vein, right? They're both in the same region but they carry different conditions of blood. They carry blood in different directions. So don't lose points off because of the easy stuff. So make sure you're doing that. And really, uh, it, the nice thing about this is obviously you need to be able to recognize all these blood vessels on the lab exam. So on the lab exam, if I'm pointing here, if I'm pointing here, if I'm pointing here, if I'm pointing here, you need to be able to recognize those blood vessels. But again, you also need to know what feeds into them and what feeds out of them. So there's nothing wrong with visually tracing the path. If I'm telling you to go to your right arm, then you should be able to figure out, all right, from the heart, I'm leaving the ascending aorta into the aortic arch. All right, from the aortic arch, if I want to get to my right arm, I need to go out the brachiocephalic trunk. And all of those are single blood vessels. But from there, I need to go into the right subclavian artery, which then feeds into the right axillary artery, which then feeds into the right brachial artery, right? There in the, in the brachial region, I undergo that capillary, right? And from there, I, I have numerous route routes that I can take back. You don't have to list all of them. You can just give one. I could go back the brachial vein, or if I wanna take a more scenic route, I could go the cephalic into the brachial, right, or the basilic into the brachial, which then feeds into the axillary, which then a uh, vein, right, all rights, which feeds into the right subclavian, which feeds into the right brachiocephalic vein, because remember we have two brachiocephalic veins and only one brachiocephalic artery. So for the veins, we have to specify right and left. And that right brachiocephalic vein feeds into the superior vena cava, a single blood vessel, so we don't have to worry about right and left into the right atrium. So there's nothing wrong with physically tracing your body as you do that. Now, again, you're gonna be on camera. So if you're doing it to your leg, don't go off camera while you're doing it. But yeah, again, as long as you're being obvious about what you're trying to do, there's nothing wrong with that. I know being recorded <laughs> while you're on camera is weird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if, you, if you really <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And Allison's trying to get a job like we were talking about earlier there. Uh, oh. But um, 
if if that's what it takes, uh, watching the videos, there was there was, the, and this is not an exaggeration. I had a student in my four thirty class who literally talked out loud for the entire exam. Every single question, it was like, all right, that's the holocranial region. That is the you know mental region. And so he uh, was saying them while he was doing while he was going through that. Uh, it is not ideal. Again, remember, just like when you're in the classroom, you wouldn't be able to do that. But um, if that's what it takes for you to be successful, at least be honest about what it is that you're doing. Try to be uh, uh, transparent about what you're doing. Uh, and then that, hopefully that will help. Again, if we're doing pathways like that drop of blood exercise, the second drop of blood exercises, you're leaving out the uh, left ventricle and coming back to right eight into the right atrium, I just want the blood vessels. For that, you wouldn't do the valves. If like the first activity, you trace the blood through the heart, through that pathway, through the pulmonary circulation and back, then yes. And again, read the questions. That's the other thing that happened on a lot, again, grading your guys' cardiovascular exercises. The cardiovascular exercise told you to use right or left told people not to just use the blood vessels, not to use the valves. And yet many people put that aortic semilunar valve on there, which screwed up their count when they were looking at the blood vessels and they forgot to put rights and lefts. So again, as I will say every single time on every single exam, more and more and more, and again, perfect examples of it on this last one, uh, the last exam, the Graham Sams that I'm grading now, read the questions carefully. People often lose points, not because they don't know the information, but because they don't read the questions carefully. Again, so many instances of someone on the, on the lab exams that I'm grading right now, and again, I'm not picking on my 430 students, this is just the exams that I'm grading right now, where I have an arrow pointing at the Golgi apparatus, and the question says, identify the function of this organelle, and they write Golgi apparatus. Clearly, by writing Golgi apparatus, they're showing me they have knowledge, they understand the material, but they didn't answer the question. And if you don't answer the question, I can't give you credit. I put a lot of time and effort into these questions, and I expect you to be careful in, in reading them. I know it's shocking, but I don't just talk here for my own sake. Right? I don't just write these things randomly. I try to put thought and effort into these things to give you what I think is important to help you to be successful. Um, so again, the advantage of these tracing a drop of blood exercises systemically is you need a turnaround point. You need a way to get from the arteries to the veins, right? And that's what the capillaries do basically do. They're your turnaround point. So yeah, at every location you are, whether it's the elbow, whether it's the big toe, whether it's the brain, you need a capillary so that you can turn around from the arteries to the veins. So that's why we use the capillaries there. We're just using it as that atrial venous anastomosis that we talked about, that turnaround point that connects the arteries to the veins so we can work our way back to the heart. So that's why we put the capillary bed there. And as we mentioned, pretty much every place in your body have a capillary. So any place I give you a destination to or any of those destinations you picked for yourself, uh, there you've got a capillary bed there to work your way back. I know, I know that part really confused me when I was doing the homework because I don't think we had, because we hadn't really done the lecture on uh, blood vessels. And I was just confused as to, because some of the examples I found online, they didn't really have that. So I just wanted to know if that's something that, but yeah, thank you. Yeah, no problem. And again, I think we, we did at least, we covered the basic pathways. I didn't cover all the blood vessels on the list, but we did cover all the basic pathways a couple of days before it was due to give people an opportunity to, to correct them if they needed to, yes. At least that was the goal. All right. I have a question about the actual, like, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to ask for the next question. So I'm ready, Ash. Oh, um, I was going to say it's more of like a logistics of the, the exam, because I know Canvas sometimes just has like a full list of questions, but then other times it says answer one. And then once you submit, you can't go back. So is it going to be more like a whole list or? So here is the goal. The goal will be a list. All right, so the goal of this is for it to be a list of all the questions. And, and let's start easy. The lecture exam absolutely is going to be a list. 30, somewhere around 30, 25 to 35 multiple choice questions, somewhere between two or six fill in the blank questions, somewhere between six and 10 essay questions, 
right? That's gonna be your lecture exam and all of them will be there at once. So you can take them in any order. If you wanna do the essay questions first or read the essay questions so you can be thinking about them while you're doing the multiple choice. If you wanna do them in order, you can do them in any order you want. The lab exam hopefully will be the same way. Again, the goal is to have them all on the screen at once, but as I warned at the beginning of class, that's the problem that literally a third, 11 of my 31 students who took the lab exam in 430 had problems getting it to load. So what I ultimately had to do is switch it to present one question at a time. However, even though it was one question at a time, the questions were not locked. So okay. if you answered something on 12 and then got to question 40 and realized you wanted to change your answer, you could go back to 12. And remember, okay. from a logistics standpoint, you don't have to keep hitting back 14 times to get back to 12. Up in the top right of your screen, in the top right of your screen is the list of all of the questions. You can just click on the question there and it will take you directly to that question. In fact, as you answer them, that'll put a check mark there. So if you skip one because you're not sure, you'll see a zero next to that question on that list. So it will, and if you try to submit it before you've answered that question, Leaf Bank, you'll get a warning that says, hey, there are still three questions that haven't been answered. Are you sure you want to submit it? So you have the ability to go back, you have the ability uh, to, uh, to change your answers, you have all of that ability. I appreciate it takes more time. So if I have to change the, the format, I will add a little bit more time just for the constant loading of the images. And it's not the way I would prefer to do it, but that's why I want you guys to start the lab exam early. If we have similar issues like we did on the last one, then I'm gonna just go ahead and flip the switch on that and give you guys a little bit more time, but it doesn't lock the questions. You'll still be able to go back and change it. So it's a little bit more familiar, similar to what we had in the classroom. In the classroom, obviously you get one question at a time, but just like in the classroom, you can go back to a question uh, and you can go back and change your answer. So it's not locked where you have to go and you only get to see something once. Okay. okay thank you. Yeah, so again, I, I would prefer not to do it that way. But if that's what we have to do, uh, if again, we have similar problems on uh, Wednesday to what I had on Thursday last week, I'm hoping that was an aberration. Uh, but if not, then I will quickly switch that. But again, the other keys to that is if you're having that problem, contact Proctorio's help first. If they're not able to help you and resolve it, then contact me. And what I will do is I can cancel your current exam and then uh, be able to provide you with another one. Now, the one thing that I would say about that is again, this is for people who have problems with them loading. Okay. If you get the images to load, that doesn't mean you get, and you don't like the exam, you can't quit it and go back. It's not what we're talking about. <laughs> and remember also, if I provide you with a second exam, it's gonna be a completely different exam with completely different questions. So it's not gonna be the same exam as the previous one. Every time you have a new attempt, it completely randomizes and selects different questions for you. So if you're having trouble where they're not loading, or I even had one student where the images loaded, but the places where you write the, the answers didn't, which is a completely unique question, uh, problem that I've never seen before on Proctorio. So like I said, Thursday was, uh, an incredibly uh, exhausting day as we were dealing with those issues, which is exactly why if we start to have those issues, we are going to catapult on it right away, pull the trigger and go to the other format. No multiple choice on the lab portion. It is all fill in the blank uh, with images and it is all uh, yeah, well, here. Let's do this. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, I can't do that. Um, I don't want to do this. Let's do it this way. This is a little bit of a cheat because this is not what it will look like, obviously, but I do. First, let's do this. And this, like I said, this test is somewhere between 70 and 90 questions. A lot of histology, a lot of anatomy on this one. And again, I'd prefer to have them all load at once, but 
the exam for the other class was only 55 questions on their first lab exam and I had a third have problems. So like I said, if it has problems, I will quickly switch to the one at a time format and hopefully that will revolve, resolve it. But again, if you have that problem after you deal with Proctorio support, contact me so that we can end your quiz and give you a second opportunity because it still has to be completed during the class time. All right, technical issues is not a valid excuse for missing the exam. All right, Laura, you seem to be keep trying to ask a question. Go ahead. I was just wondering how much math we were given a lot of formulas and I want to make sure I have all of them. And I so I would say definitely the one formula that isn't important is the one about the diameter of a blood vessel. So that one is definitely, you know, like the, 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 the flow is one over resist the radius to the fourth power. That wasn't one that was important, but uh, capillary exchange, right? Heart, uh, cardiac output, uh, uh, systolic, uh, stroke volume, all of those are things that definitely were numbers that not only did we talk about the, the average numbers in the, uh, for a person, but those are equations that absolutely we have to know, absolutely. Is um, the capillary, is the capillary one the um, net hydrostatic pressures and stuff? That's the capillary? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Those, those are the numbers for capillary exchange, absolutely. Uh, to answer quickly the other question, yes, anything we do in class, that means both the lecture and all of the homeworks. If I give you a physio X or a labster that takes you three hours to do, right? Don't you think that those three hours were important time? Do you think that I was just torturing you for three hours? Or do you think that that's information that I felt was important? And if the information is stuff that I feel is important, then absolutely you're responsible for it. So anything that, even if we didn't go over it in lecture, if it was something you had to do for a lab assignment, absolutely it is material you are responsible for on the exam. Right? Those of you who had 430 know that because on the very first exam, I made you do the diffusion physio X and there's a question on the, the diffusion physio X on the first one. So absolutely, things like the ECG, things like uh, cardiac output, uh, things like blood typing that we just did, all of those are things that, and many of those are things that we also talked about in the classroom. So if you had a virtual lab and we talked about it in the classroom, like blood typing, I'm guessing there's going to be a blood typing question on the exam, so absolutely. My job, look, life is tough enough. My job isn't gonna give you busy work. The things I give you to do are things that I think are important. And the things that I think are important are the things that end up on the exam. That's what I love about this class. This class is hard, not because the concepts are hard, but because there's so much information. And so as an instructor, that's incredibly freeing. I don't have to be tricky with the exams. I can tell you X, Y, and Z is gonna be on the exam because I still know you're gonna spend hours studying X, Y, and Z. So I love that about this class. So yeah, the things that we spend time on, at home or in class are things that are important and the things that are important are gonna end up on the exam. Now, the one thing I would add to that is even in the in-classroom situation, obviously we cover more stuff in the, in the section than what's gonna be on the exam concept wise, but you know we still sample from it. This one, the sampling is completely random. I have no control over the exams that you get. I have some say as to how I, you know, bank my questions, but which questions everybody's going to get is going to be completely different, which again is frustrating from an instructor because I like that control, but it's also very freeing because I can say, yeah, there's going to be blood type questions on there because I don't know who's going to get them and who's not going to get them and which one's going to get which type and everything else in between. So it's uh, both frustrating and liberating that way. Good time for one or two more if you guys have them. With the math questions, are there is there a calculator on there? Like in the whiteboard or something? I believe there is a calculator in there, but what I would say is I don't think any of the math should be so, you know, I mean, we're talking about, you know, multiplying and dividing and, and adding and subtracting. None of it should be so complicated that you would need, you know, but I think there, technically, I think there is a, a, a calculator on there, yes, but you shouldn't need it. There is a calculator. Yeah, there you go. So. But it's all stuff that you should either be able to do in your head or because often you want to be showing your work anyway. So you want to write, right? 
1500 plus 1200 equals 2700 or whatever it is, you know? So you wanna be writing it out anyway. All right, because that's really one of the keys to this. One, I know people don't like essay questions, but the magic of essay questions is partial credit. All right, with a multiple choice question, it's either right or wrong. You could completely have mastered a concept. Heck, your uncle could have been the one that discovered it. You could have had your picture taken with that concept, but you misread one word in the question, you misinterpret the question, you answer it wrong, and you get zero points, regardless of how much knowledge you have. However, on an essay question, yes, if you know all the information, you're going to get all the points. But even if you just know some of the information, you're going to get some of the points. And just writing down a number, how do I know whether you got that right by luck or by, you know, guess? If it's the right number, then that's fine, I guess. But if you have the wrong number and you've given me no work, you haven't shown me all how you came up with that number, then I have to decide whether you just randomly picked that number or if you just add it instead of subtract it at one point. Whereas if you show me your work, you can get partial credit for that. So be showing me your work anyway when you're doing that math. All right. Anything else? All right. The last thing I will leave you with going into Wednesday's exam is to remind you of this. One of the advantages of this class is that there are a ton of points. With five lab exams, five lecture exams, and a final exam, there is a ton of points in this class. And what that means is no one exam can make or break your grade, right? If someone completely aces this first exam, can they take the rest of the semester off and glide on that exam score and just be able to get the grade they want at the end? No, they're still gonna work really hard. They should feel good about themselves that they prepared for this first exam this, the right way. And if they continue to prepare that way, they'll continue to be successful. By the same token, if you are not as successful on this exam as you want to be, you shouldn't go home and flog yourself as a result of it, right? Be disappointed, but use it as a learning experience so that now you know you need to attack the material in a different way. No matter what score you get on these first exams, mathematically, every single person in this class is gonna still be capable of getting an A. Now, some will have to work harder to turn their grades around than others, but remember your final can replace your lowest lecture score. So even if you get a zero on this first lecture score and you really gotta go out of your way to get a zero on a lecture score, right? But even if you did get a zero on a lecture score, you could replace it with the final at the end and it would go away entirely. All right. We're going to finish this class with somewhere around 12 to 1300 points. Yeah, our first lab exam is going to be somewhere between 60 and 80 or 90 points, but it's still that can be overcome. So study hard, do well, but know that even if you're not successful, if you learn, use this as a learning experience, you can still get your grade you want in this class at the end. So this is an important test, but it's also a gauge of how you're preparing for this class. And it's especially important in a class like this where there's not as many students who had me as fourth for the 431 for 430. So for some of you, it's a unique, different way of studying for this material, being tested on this material. So there can be some growing pains. All right. Almost everybody who's here who had me for 430 will tell you their grades improved as they moved through the semester because they got better at understanding what I was looking for on these and how to prepare for them. All right. So with that, I will remind you I have office hours after class today. If you guys have more questions, I can be reached by email. And I even have office hours tomorrow from, what is it, 11 to noon before my 430 class. So I'll be around with that if you guys have any questions. Otherwise, study hard. Uh, good luck on, uh, on, Thursday, on Wednesday. And keep your fingers crossed that everything goes well. I will Thank see you. you guys. And remember, no lecture on Wednesday either. So hopefully I will not hear from you on Wednesday. And enjoy your week off. And I will see you next uh, Monday, next Wednesday, next Wednesday. All right. Bye, guys.